All right. All set. The chair notes the time is 6.01. I call this meeting of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals to order. My name is Steve Judge. As ZBA chair, I want to welcome everyone to this meeting. We'll begin with the roll call of the ZBA members. Steve Judge is present. Mr. Craig Meadows. Present. Mr. Everald Henry. Here. Mr. Philip White. Here. And Ms. Hilda Greenbaum. Here. The quorum is present. Also attending the public hearing tonight is Christine Brestrup, Planning Director for the Town, and Mr. Rob Wachilla, Planner for the Town. We have Carolyn Murray, Counsel for us, also in attendance. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 21, extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this meeting will be conducted via remote meetings. Members of the public who wish to observe the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. The Zoning Board of Appeals is a quasi-judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 40A of the General Laws of the Commonwealth for the purpose of promoting the health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. In accordance with the provisions of Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 40A and Article 10, Special Permit Granting Authority of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw, this public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties of interest. All hearings and meetings are open to the public and are recorded by town staff and may be viewed via the town of Amherst YouTube channel and ZBA webpage. The procedure is as follows. The petitioner presents the application to the board during the hearing, after which the board will ask for questions, questions for clarification or for additional information. After the board has completed its questions, the board will seek public input. The public speaks with the permission of the chair. If a member of the public wishes to speak, they should so indicate by using the raise hand function on their screen or by pressing uh, pound nine on their phone. The chair, with the assistance of the staff, will call upon people wishing to speak. When you are recognized, provide your name and address to the board for the record. All questions and comments must be addressed to the board. The board will normally hold public hearings where the information about the project and input from the public is gathered, followed by public meetings for each. The public meeting portion is when the board deliberates and is generally not an opportunity for public comment. If the board feels it has enough information and time, it will decide upon the applications tonight. Each petition heard by the board is distinct and evaluated on its own merits, and the board is not ruled by precedent. Tonight's agenda, consideration of minutes from, the, uh, from uh, December 21st, 2023 and January 4th, 2024, a public hearing on ZBA FY 2024-03, Valley Community Development Corporation, request for a comprehensive permit under Massachusetts General, Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 40B to construct 30 owner-occupied affordable residential units located on 15 in 15 duplex structures, parking areas with 58 spaces, common areas and other site improvements on a 9.047 acre site with requested wa waivers from the zoning bylaw, general bylaws, subdivision regulations, sewer water connections approvals at 2020 ball, 2040 Ball Lane, Map 5A, Parcel 56, RN, Neighborhood Residence, and RLD, Low Density Residential Zoning Districts, and FC, Farmland Conservation Overlay Districts. This is being continued from uh, February 15th, 2024. After consideration of the um, the 40B application. There's a general public comment period on matters not before the board tonight. And after that is any business not anticipated within the last 48 hours. So the first order of business is consideration of minutes from December 21st, 2023. Have uh, members of the board had a chance to review the minutes and do they have any changes or alterations to the minutes from December 23rd or 21st? If not, I will um, entertain a motion to approve the minutes from December 21st, 2023. Do I have a motion? So moved, Mr. Chair. Uh, is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion on the motion to approve the minutes from December 21st? If not, the vote occurs on the motion to approve the minutes of December 23rd, 2023. The chair votes aye. Mr. White? Aye. Mr. Meadows? 
Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Ms. Greenbaum? Aye. The vote is five to nothing. The minutes from December 21st are approved. The next order of business is the minutes from Thursday, January 4th, 2024. Um, does anybody have any um, changes? I found the typo on page four, which I called Rob about. All right, Rob, are you aware of that typo? I am, but uh, Miss Greenbaum, if you could remind me again what the typo was, please, just so I can put that down on the record. Uh, C O U L D should have been C O U N T on line four, line five of page four. So, um, is it the second bullet point where it says Hilda Greenbaum asked if someone qualifies yeah, tier yeah. one? Okay, okay. That, that could couldn't. as a person instead of count as a person. Okay, we'll do. All right. Any other alterations or changes to the motion or to the minutes? If not, I'd entertain a motion to approve the minutes from as amended from Thursday, January 4th, 2024. So moved. Is there a second? Aye. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? If there's no further discussion, the vote occurs on the motion to approve the minutes. The chair votes aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. White? Aye. Ms. Greenbaum? Aye. The vote is 5 nothing. The minutes from uh, January 4th are approved. Thank you all. Uh, the next order of business is further consideration of ZBA FY 2024-03, Valley Community Development Corporation, requesting a comprehensive permit under Massachusetts General Laws 40B to construct 30 owner-occupied affordable residential units located on a fifth, in 15 duplex structures and 58 parking spaces, common areas, and other site improvements on a 9.047 acre site um, on 2040 Ball Lane. Um, the first thing we need to do is go through the additional submissions that we have and. We can do that by going to the project application report, which I think you received earlier. There's several, uh, there are many updated plans which we've received from the applicant. I'll just read them quickly. The stormwater pollution prevention plan was updated uh, February 21st. The stormwater operations and maintenance plan was updated uh, February 21st. Um, site plans, including C2, which is the existing conditions, C3 demolitions, C4 site plan design, C5 grading plan, C6 stormwater management plan, C7 up utility plan, C8 lighting plan, C9 soil erosion and sediment control plan, C10 through 15 are construction details, C um, uh, L100 site materials, so the, the, up to that point, they were all updated um, March 5th, 2024. L100 is site materials, L101 site layout, L400 is planting plan, L500 is site details, L500 is site details again. Those are all updated February 21st, 2024. Um, and there are no other updated submissions. Have we received any submissions or public comments, Rob, since our last no meeting? No public comments. Um, and I any, believe. Any town no, comments? Nope. No further comments from public or the town. So, no further submissions that we know of? Nope. All right. Great. Um, I guess I should ask if any, as I do, does anybody have any um, uh, declarations or disclosures to make since our last meeting? If not, Here's why, how I think we should go about today's meeting to be as efficient as possible and to try to get this accomplished. Uh, and hopefully we can um, make our decision on this, on this project. What I'd like to do is go through updates that we requested at the last meeting. And there are several of those, have update those, and then um, we'll have public comment because we'll be in a public meeting. 
after that, we'll, I'd like to to, um, to look at the uh, conditions. Well, first, I'd look at waivers. There's two changes to the waivers. Adopt or reject the waivers through our consideration. Next, go to conditions, work through conditions, and I'll try to break those down into manageable parts. We, don't, we won't consider all 75 conditions all at once. Try to break them down by substance or at least by a uh, number of, you know, some manageable number, and then we'll do findings, because I think the conditions are the things that allow us to make the findings. And so that's the way that we'll go through that. And then at the end of that, if we complete that tonight, then we have a vote on the project. So that's what, how I intend to uh, proceed. And I think that's the most efficient way for us to do it tonight. So at our last meeting, the updates requested included an update on the conservation committee commission's consideration an update on the waiver request list, discussion of the ANR plan for the abutting house, EV spaces, number of units on which the local preference could apply, how eligibility is determined for non-related households, and affirmative obligations for outreach and financial counseling um, in, the, uh, in, the, in the outreach plan for the uh, um, outreach to potential applicants. So those are the things I, that I recorded from last meeting that be, need, we need updates from. And many of those were coming from um, Valley CDC. So if, if I think the most important thing would be to have Ms. Allen um, go through the first start off with the, your uh, experience at the Conservation Commission. And if you're completed with that or if there's more work to do. And please, for the record, give us your name and address as you've done several, <laughs> seven times before on this application. <laughs> Jessica Allen, uh, real estate project manager, um, uh, 256 Pleasant Street in Northampton, Mass. And is Ms. Thiebo also with you? Yes, she is. And Ms. Thiebo, can, just so we can make this as quick as possible, could you give us your name and address as well for the record in case you want to add something? Sure. Hi, Rebecca Thiebo uh, from Doherty Wallace, Pillsbury and Murphy, State Street in Northampton, Mass. Thank you. All right, Ms. Allen, uh, tell us how the what happened with the Conservation Commission? So we received our uh, approvals from the Conservation Commission at our last meeting, and we have um, a signed order of conditions, which I believe was in your meeting packet. Um, so we had to amend the site plans, and I'm happy to share my screen and just give you a quick overview of, of what it was. It's mostly stormwater. Um, mm -hmm. So would you like me to do that right now? Would that be helpful? That'd be helpful now, just so we understand it. Those are mostly the things that came on uh, the 5th of March, right? The updates right. on the 5th of March, okay. Yep. Um, let's see, let's get the right one here. Okay. Can you see the site plan? Yep. Okay, perfect. So um, we needed to, because we had some, some uh, high groundwater in what had been the uh, previous infiltration basin, um, we had to do a redesign of the stormwater. So essentially the site plan doesn't look all that much different except for the stormwater system. So none of the buildings changed, um, none of the pathways changed, the parking didn't change, all of that remains the same. Um, what the major change that happened was the redesign of the basin. So the basin has been moved closer to the intersection um, and the reason we did this is otherwise we were going to lose these trees. So um, we spent a lot of time working out a design um, that would enable us to preserve these large trees and keep those as part of the site plan um, by still accommodating the, the um, stormwater needs of the site. So how we were able to sort of reduce this is that these um, common areas will have about a six inch drop into them. So they'll remain flat on the inside. So you'll see that there's a grade line here, this grade line right here. So you, there's a slight change in the grade um, and that will allow water to um, infiltrate in these areas during um, heavy storm events. The storm water will not be there more than 24 hours. Um, and this would, having each of these little areas be kind of a pocket infiltration area allowed us to modify this design, shrink it in size, and then also move it so that we were able to um, get it into the area of where there's a lower grade and preserve these trees. So that was the that was the major 
change from the site plan. Um, it looks fairly simple in terms of the site plan, but I will tell you the civil team spent a crazy amount of time coming up with this design. This design, uh, the site is, was a little bit more challenging because of the high groundwater than they anticipated. So um, it, it took several weeks for them to sort of work out something that made the numbers work. So I think one of the questions that had come up in the past is with the stormwater design, how much impervious square footage remains on the site for any future um, development. So per their calculations, there's about 3,500 square feet of impervious surface that could be accommodated for any additional items. So if there's any questions about the site plan, or I, just please let me know. The question I had was on the additional impervious area on your band side. Um, Ms. Greenbaum. Um, some of those areas were expected to be like gathering areas for people to sit can they still be used for that purpose or absolutely, absolutely. yep yeah the, the water won't collect there for a very long period of time so we anticipate that these areas will kind of have a dual purpose they will still be um, pocket parks park it pocket green spaces for the neighbors and for the community but also will serve as um, small infiltration basins in order to reduce the impervious flow um, to the basin thank you mm -hmm. All right, so it, the long and short of it is the Con Con Commission gave you the required approvals and we're ready to move, and you, as far as they are concerned and you're concerned, we're ready, we are ready to move forward on the site plans in, in terms of a stormwater uh, Correct. mitigation, yep. okay? Yep. The next item is we had to update the waiver requests. Um, there were a couple that, that came from, that I see in the, project, the draft project application report both of those relate to the CONCOM work. Um, we'll get a chance to look at, to vote on these at a later point, but they're the last two, they're in red. Um, but I don't think there's much explanation needed for those, is there, Ms. Allen? Pretty I don't think so. It's just that we, because of the, the shift in pushing the basin to save the trees, we um, disturbed, we're proposing to disturb more of the 50 foot and 100 foot buffer area to the wetlands. Okay. And the town has a local wetlands bylaw that set certain percentages of alteration of those buffer areas. And so we're slightly over those um, alteration numbers. So that's why the waiver is being requested. And the one that's kind of significant, it's not so significant to go to from 20 to 23.5, but the one that is significant is a, as opposed to 50 feet of area of the five foot, but the um, stormwater buffer. But the COM, com has looked at that and said that the grading and other things are sufficient to provide um, protection to the wetlands, right? Correct. And then there's, you know, um, there's a, a erosion control plan that will prevent any impacts to the wetland while we're under construction. All right. Any questions about the uh, those waivers from any board member? If not, the other thing that we have is a discussion of the ANR plan for the abutting house. This gets really complicated, but what we what we requested at the last meeting is that we find a way to um, uh, to allow this to happen by using the 40B process. And um, I've talked with Rob about this. It's a, it's arcane Byzantine law that deals with the 40B. I know that they've worked hard on this. I think the bottom line is that, uh, and you can describe it if you want, either Rob or Carolyn or, or Christine, you can describe it if you want, but I think the bottom line here is that we figured out a way to meet the needs of the neighbor, meet the needs of the applicant, and the town is comfortable in providing this uh, flag lot. Is there anything else that we need to know about as the board, Carolyn or, or Rob or Christine, we need to know about the um, ANR uh, plan for the abutting home? So, um, Chris, do you want to answer that or do you want me to take a stab at it? I, um, I just I had a question about that. Um, when I look through the list of requested waivers, there's one that says, Based on Rob's confirmation of dimensions for an A&R lot, it does not appear this waiver is needed. That's waiver, what is it, 4.324. I guess I would just say leave it in anyway in case it is needed. We're not absolutely sure. So I would err on this side of caution and leave that waiver in there. Okay, if so. nobody objects. I don't object to that, but I, you know what, I, Ms. Brustrup, I think 
I don't see that in the, the draft project application. It's four point what? Um, it's section 4.324. It's on page 29 of the decision. I know you haven't gotten to the oh, decision yet, but the, the um, decision let, me document? Can, let me see if I can find it in the. Um, yeah, it's not in the draft application, draft project application report. I don't think you're right. It looks like it was dropped. It was dropped. Would you like to put that back in? Is that what you're. Um, I think so. I think because there's confusion about the ANR. I would just prefer right. to put it back in in case it in case that A&R needs that waiver. That would make me feel more comfortable. But the, the, right. this is the um the section right here that was right. taken out. Miss yeah. Pressure was referring to. Right, that's what I'm referring to. I just you know belt and suspenders and all of that. I feel more comfortable having it there, and maybe we won't need it, but it makes me feel better to have it there. And that's and, uh, four point three two four. Yeah. Yep. All right. Is anybody all right? Thank you. That's so when we deal with um, the waivers, we consider the waivers at a later on in the process. Mm -hmm. We'll remember to do that. Okay. Any other questions regarding the waivers? Last uh, next is the EV spaces. Uh, I there was a there was some confusion. There's also a waiver request that needs to be made to the state. Can't be made at the current time. It has to be made later. You guys came up with, um, in discussion with the town's staff, you came up with a mechanism in order to um, see if you can get a waiver from the state. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. So we had a meeting with um, town planning staff and uh, building department to discuss what was the best approach forward. And so uh, the consensus was to leave the EV space design as initially proposed, so having metered dual head um, uh, dual head meters there for people to plug into, rather than meeting the stretch code requirements, which doesn't the building department agreed the design doesn't really match this project. Um, it's they're just kind of offset. So we will move forward with the variance. He has agreed to put forth the paperwork that he needs to do in order for us to move forward with the variance at the state building. And that's reflected in condition 54 as amended, I think, in the, in the, the, so. the it's draft gonna... decision document. Yeah. All right. Yep. So we can discuss the, the, uh, the relative merits of that or the details of that when we get to condition 54. But it's been, uh, you guys worked on something to re regarding that. Um, Next item was the number of space, number of units to which local preference could apply. We had some confusion. And we, what, the understanding was you were, in sound, you were going to go to the state, I think. And since they, they are not the Commonwealth builders, the state is the one that controls how many units um, would local preference would apply to. Which type of units? Can you tell us what you've learned and what's the deal there? Sure. And I believe a copy of the email was in your meeting packet as well. Um, so we went to Mass Housing's 40B program, our pro, uh, program contact there, and asked the question. And her response was that the local preference only applies to the 80% AMI units. So that's 10 but, units. Uh, total, that's, that's 10 units, right? Total, yep, 10 units. It, well, if I may, Mr. Chair? Yes, yes, please. Ms. Mar the Ms. Local, sorry, uh, the local preference, as you know, the maximum is 70 percent. Right. So it'd be 70, so it would really be the seven units. If you remember at our last meeting, we were debating whether it was seven or 21 and the correct number would be the maximum of seven if you choose to go the local preference. Right. It's 70 percent of 10. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, the next question we had was how is eligibility determined? Is there any question about the, I don't want to leave that without. Going yes. Into, yep. Hilda has her hand up. Yep. Go ahead, Ms. Greenbaum. Um, I'm still confused about local preference. When they say seven units, is that a guarantee more or less, or is that an upper limit of number of people from Amherst who can live? in the 30 units and those what's the difference between if we have local preference or don't i know you gave the chat last week but i'm confused so if if we have local preference then seven 
of the 10, 80% AMI units can have local preference, which would be the third category at the number of um, family members and living in a, well, I'm going to school, D D I H or whatever they're called. Yep. The new name. All right. So if you get the seven, does that, is that an upper limit to the number of amorous people or can some more amorous people move in under either condition if they fit the other categories or for, for the other, for the other units, the hundred percent units, can they be, or are we limited to just the seven? I don't understand how it works is what I'm trying to say. So if there were Amherst residents who lived in the qualified census tract and met the number of household limits for the bedroom count that they were requesting, they could potentially, names could get pulled from in the lottery process and they could be selected for a home. In addition to the seven. Yes, but so with that seven though, if you recall, this is a tiered um, process, not a pool right. process like a rental project. So if say there were not seven eligible households that were able to qualify for a mortgage and met all the requirements under the Commonwealth Builder Program, having assets under $100,000 and all that stuff, um, those it, you kind of get just one chance in that in that tier and then whatever is not filled goes down to the next tier so it's it, kind of it's a cap not not a guarantee as we discussed it's entirely that. possible that local preference doesn't even get used that you have 10 pe 10 applicants that can be satisfied tier one and tier two and you don't even go to tier three being local preference correct correct yeah but but so, i'm still so you know what i I'm still confused. So are we well, going to talk about more of this later? Yes. Yeah, we're going to have, I'm sure we're going to have a long discussion about it. Um, okay. okay. About, yep. And I'd like to have that when we get to the, what will be one of the first conditions we will be talking about. So we'll have that in a few minutes. Any other comments on, um, on the uh, local preference determination of, to which units local preference applies? All right. Next is how eligibility is determined by not for non-related households. And I think that was the case where you didn't have you had an unmarried couple or you had other unrelated people living in the same house. Um, where was, well, I, I've, I don't remember the exact question that was posed at the time, but I know we wanted to get some clar clarity as to how you figure household income for unrelated. So a household does not have to, they do not have to be related parties. They, they just need to be individuals or co-tenants. Got it. And in this case, co-owners. And in this case, co-owners, correct. Okay. And meet all the requirements under the Commonwealth Builder Program. So they first time home buyers, not having, um, being income eligible um, as a household and not having combined assets of over a hundred thousand. I mean, uh, yeah, a hundred thousand. Okay. Okay, and last, next was affirmative obligations for outreach and financial counseling. I noticed that there were some changes to the, um, we got a copy of the, the springing agreement, which is the first time I've ever heard that term applied to something, the springing agreement. And uh, I also have some, uh, a further thought on that, but um, we've got the information we also have, I think uh, in findings, there's another, uh, or someplace, there, not, not in findings, but um, in the conditions, there's another amendment which deals with this. So we'll have a chance to talk about this and you did provide us some additional information or uh, some additional language. So those are the, the uh, items we asked for. We got most, I, I don't think there was anything else that we had requested from the applicant or from the town or from uh, Ms. Murray to clarify our uh, consideration of this matter. And since we've done all this and the next steps are to go through waivers, conditions and findings, what I'd like to do is go to public comment now and have public comment, um, unless there's any other questions from board members. And then after public comment, we'll go into the public meeting while keeping the public hearing open in case we need to gather any additional information. And then we'll begin our deliberation on waivers, conditions, and findings. Is there any objection to that? All right. Let's see if there's anybody uh, from the public who wishes to comment on the application before us. 
Bob, I haven't looked at yet. Do we have any attendees who wish to comment? I'm seeing people from the applicants project team. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not seeing anybody else raise their hand. Yeah. Um, I. Yeah, I would say safe to say no public comment. All right. At this point, we see no public comment. Um, I would entertain a motion that we move to the public meeting while keeping the public hearing open in order to gather additional information if we need it. Do I have so such a move? So move. A, great. Thank you, Mr. Greenbaum. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? If not, I would call the vote on the motion to move to a public meeting while keeping the public hearing open. The chair votes aye. Mr. White? Aye. Mr. Henry? Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Ms. Greenbaum? Aye. The motion uh, passed on 5 0 vote. Now is the time to. Um, is the time where the board deliberates the um, the matters before us, conditions, waivers, conditions, and findings. It is generally not a time for public comment. If there is a public comment, if there is additional information to be gathered, the board has it. The board, at at my discretion or at your discretion, um, can gather additional information and seek additional public input. But this is a place where we deliberate um, the merits of the proposal before us. All right. So in this public meeting, I think the first thing to do is to go through the waivers. And uh, most of the, we've, we've been through the waivers last week, except for the two new ones and the, um, and the, the uh, belts and suspenders that um, Ms. Brestrup wanted. Could I, uh, Ms. Brestrup, your hands up. What did I forget? Two things. I want to retract my earlier statement about the belt and suspenders. I now understand why that waiver was deleted, and I'm happy to have it deleted. So I'm sorry for kind of wasting your time with that. No. But I also wanted to um, ask if anyone has missed a past uh, session of this public no. hearing session, um, and have they um, attested that they have watched the video and you know, reviewed the material and therefore are eligible to vote. So any of you who have missed a past public hearing session, have you done that? I have not missed one on this. Mr. Meadows did submit his, um, his Mullins real form. And Craig, I think you're the only person that might have missed a meeting because you missed one back in January, right? Correct. Yes. Yeah, so he he did get that form to me a week before the last meeting in February. Um, Mr. White, Mr. Henry, you guys didn't miss a meeting, right? No. And Hilda, I know you didn't miss a meeting, so no, I've been here. All right. Hey, thank you. None. Thank you yeah. very much. All righty. Good to check. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bresco. All right. So I don't think there's a unless. I'm, I don't think that there is a need to have a long discussion on the waivers. The two that are out there today that are new that we haven't discussed before has been described by the, by the applicant. They're the last two in the uh, draft project application uh, report. Um, they deal with the outcome of the, the CONCOM. There's, they're in red. So I would entertain a motion that we uh, grant the waivers as laid out in the draft project application report dated March 8th, 2020, which includes these two new ones in red. Um, do I have such a motion? So, so moved. Move. Okay. I got a motion and it sounds like I got a second as well from the screen bomb. Yes. Yeah. All right. Discussion on granting on the motion to grant the waiver request. As I, as outlined in the draft project application report. Okay, if there's no discussion of the waivers, I, uh, the vote occurs on the waivers. Uh, the vote occurs on granting the waivers. 
The chair votes aye. Ms. Greenbaum? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. White? Aye. The vote is five nothing. Uh, the waivers and the, the motion passes to grant those waivers. The next order of business is to, is to move to consideration of conditions. And I think the best way to do that is to go to the decision document uh, the draft is th of March 7th, 2024. Um, it looks like, yeah, do you have that up, Rob? And it begins on page, I think, 10 of the decision document. Yep, so I actually have that on the screen, Mr. Chair. I believe at a previous meeting, at the last meeting, it was... Uh, did we we went through conditions one to eight, I believe. We went through condition. Actually, we went through conditions one through ten. ten. We did not. It, we tentatively approved conditions. Tentatively, it's not formal. We could approve conditions one, two, um, four, five, six, nine, and ten. So we did not tentatively approve conditions. Um, three, seven, and eight. So what I, what I would like to do is take the conditions that we've tentatively approved and discussed at the last meeting and approve those conditions here and then begin discussion on conditions three, seven, and eight, which includes the um, local preference provisions. So do I have a motion to, to approve conditions one, two, four, five, six, nine, and 10, 11, and 12 uh, at this point. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? The vote occurs on the motion to approve the stated conditions. Uh, the chair votes aye. Mr. Henry? Mr. Henry? Ms. Greenbaum? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. White? Aye. Um, Mr. Henry, can you hear me? No, I can't. I'm having very bad internet issues tonight. I'm sorry. That's okay. It, it looked like you were, uh, got it. It looks like at times it kind of um, flares out, or it it, it, it does. Um, you lose connectivity, it seems. Yes, I'm trying to get on my phone, but um, I, I vote aye if you heard that. All right, thank you. So, Mr. Um, Mr. Henry, can I make a suggestion? Um, try turn off your video. That'll actually help a lot with your connectivity issues. I'm sorry, try turning off my video. Yes, I'm doing that periodically. Um... Mm -hmm. All right, so the vote was, fi was five to nothing. We've approved the listed conditions. Now, um, we'd like to discuss um, the other conditions within the first 12. The first is a regulatory agreement. Um, We've gotten a copy of that regulatory agreement. It deals with uh, the local spring regulatory agreement. Um, we didn't discuss this because we were waiting for to, to see the regulatory agreement that the town has. Uh, and I, I reviewed it. It seems to make sense. I don't think this is the place to talk about additional. Um, I will propose an, an, at a different condition, some additional language, but this regulatory agreement seems to me to work uh, to be fine. I don't have any. I don't have any questions about it, Ms. Breshkup or the, Ms. Murray. Do you have any questions about the condition as amended before us? Uh, if I may, Ms. Chair, I know our last meeting there was some question about whether or not the town could be a party mm -hmm. to the regulatory agreement between Mass Housing and um, and the applicant, and we can, um, but the local, as you, as we call it, the springing regulatory agreement would also be a belt and suspenders approach where that would only kick in 
if something were to happen with the state regulatory agreement. Okay. And this, this accomplishes that, right? Yes, it does. Okay. So we'll try to avoid voting on individual um, conditions as much as possible, but we've got this one before us. Um, unless there's any questions about the effect of this, uh, I think it's, this may also be belt and suspenders. Um, I'd entertain a motion to uh, approve condition three. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? If not, the vote occurs on approval of condition three as amended. Uh, the chair votes aye. Mr. White? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Ms. Greenbaum? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. All right, vote is five nothing. Condition three is adopted. Can the I next... ask a dumb question? Yeah. What's belt and suspenders? <laughs> 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 it's, you know, it, it's, it's uh, being overly cautious and extra prepared. So that, oh, okay. okay. So that not only do you have a belt on, for what I think of it as, is not only do you have a belt on to hold your pants up, you've got suspenders yep. in case the belt fails. Okay. That's what that's. I what never I'm heard it before, so I thought I would ask. Well, it's kind of like malarkey from the president. It's it's older. I I think of it as an as an older uh, saying. Yeah. Well, you know, everybody wears jeans now, so we don't wear suspenders anymore. Right. All right. Um, the next one is, uh, I think, one that we will want to spend some time on, and that's local preference. Um, we had a long discussion, the last, a long discussion at the last meeting on local preference. I know there's still some questions regarding local preference and, and um, how it works and how it applies, and, the, and most importantly, the effect of local preference on um, different populations. So um, at that time, I expressed a support for local preference. I think that it's, um, and as I said at the time, I think it helps, number one, to um, provide public support for these kinds of efforts where we use town resources. Um, and it, I think it's important that we do that, do this kind of effort, uh, this kind of programs and this kind of assistance to um, households in the, in the community and I think it's important that the town continues to support those efforts. And one way is to have uh, a local preference for people who either live here, whose children go to school here, or who work in Amherst. Um, I also think that there's been a, you know, a really thoughtful analysis of this by Mr. Henry, that, this, um, can, that it, at times in the past, local preferences and other zoning laws and zoning provisions have worked to exclude either intentionally or unintentionally exclude people of color and others um, who are who have been economically disadvantaged uh, from housing opportunities. I don't think that's the case here. I think that the case here is that it, if there is, uh, if, if there, if we get to the third tier in these, in the set of up to in the ten houses. And if we get to the third tier, it means that someone who has met the met the local prep, met, met the, the right size household, number one, who has met who lives in a qualifying um, census tract, or who meets the um, traditionally disadvantaged criteria, and who also lives, works, or has children who go to school in Amherst, has a bit more has a better chance of getting the, uh, the, app, the, the unit than the person who does not live in Amherst. And I would be really concerned if Amherst was, that if this preference then this limited preference for people who live, work, or have children that go to school here, was in a community that was, uh, that had, like Hadley, had a very, very small population and that the qualified census tract in Hadley had a small population of, of, of BIPOC people. I'm less concerned in, about that happening here because I don't think it's the intent. I don't think that anybody who's, who intends to, to uh, implement this program would allow it, but I don't think it would be the unintended consequence of excluding people from um, people of color in the, um, 
in the application of this, this program. In fact, I think that for people in this, for populous towns around us, we have more BIPOC people in our town than we do in Hadley or Belchertown or other towns that are close by. Uh, they wouldn't meet, the, they wouldn't, those towns wouldn't meet the qualified census track. Anyway, well, Belchertown, I think, would, but the other towns would not meet the qualified census track. I think we're looking at a very limited effect from the local preference, but I think it's important to have it for um, for political reasons and, quite frankly, to su sustain support for the for the programs like this in the future. So I can I'm in favor of a seventy percent local preference, um, and I think that the the um, examples that were given by the applicant last week show that the effect of this is small, but it it could it could provide somebody who lives, works, or has children that goes to school in Amherst with a, a preference over somebody who does not live, work, or have children in school in Amherst. It would still though have to be meet the household size. They still have to live in the QCT or meets the DHI DIH uh, requirements in order to qualify for in order to have the benefit of the local preference. So that's where I'm that's where I've come down on. I've thought a lot about this over the last month. I think this is a hard decision, but um, it's where I come down at this time. So I'd like to see if other people wish to speak to this issue. Ms. Greenbaum. I'm still confused, as I said before. Okay. Um, they only apply to the 80%. So does that mean that only seven people from Amherst can live in the 30 units? Or is that guaranteed that seven no. will be picked for the no. 30? How Neither does it work? I mean, I understand about the third tier, but, but what happens like there are only 30 applicants and they all come from Amherst. Can they all have a chance at, at getting a house? How? Under either scenario, vote yes okay. or vote. So let's, let's take these one by one. So your first question is, if you have 30 people applying for the 10 space, for the 10 80% spaces, and they're all from Amherst, can they all, and they all meet the qualifications of level one, level two, and level three, if there is local preference, can they all, would, would we be able to have 10 units of, 10, the 10 units have Amherst residents in them? I think the answer is yes, but I'm gonna leave that to either Ms. Allen or Ms. Murray to, to uh, tell me how that would work. 30 applications all meet tier one, two, and three, including local preference. Would we have 10 people from Amherst in that case? If they're all- if they're all applying for the 80% AMI, if their yep. household income is 80% AMI or less, not all 30 will be there because you need, because there is 20 homes that are for 100% AMI and less. So, um, so those folks that, um, that if you filled those seven slots. Ms. Allen, can I just stop? I think your question was, we're just dealing with the 80%. Okay. Okay, so we have 30 people, 30 applications for the 80 for the 10 units, the 10 okay. 80 percent units, the only place that local preference can apply. Right. So if we have 30 applications for the 10 units and they all meet one, two and three, if we have local preference, would there be 10 uh, local prep? Could there be 10 local uh, people in people who meet the local preference qualifications? living in those units or are they artificially limited to seven? So the assumption is that in that those 30 applicants, there's no other households okay. from any other community. That that all Ms. of Greenbaum's the households question. are only from Amherst, nowhere else. That's Ms. That's Ms. Greenbaum's question, I think. Yes. So is it yes or no? I don't understand. What did she say? She hasn't answered it yet. She's gonna answer it. I haven't it. answered yet because I'm trying to understand what the question is. I, I mean, I think to some extent, these are unrealistic scenarios that we're playing Good. with. You know, I, I don't think that there's going to be a case where you're going to have only 30 people, first of all, probably applying for 10 homes and all of them coming from Amherst. You know, we are doing a robust marketing plan and we're, and we, yes, we will be doing 
targeted marketing in Amherst, but we're also going to be doing targeted marketing in other qualified census tracts around the region. So, um, you know, we can we can we can answer these questions, but I'm not sure in the reality of the scenario of its actual how it's actually going to play out whether this is going to make a difference or not. So, I mean, if you only had 30 applicants and they were applying for the 10 80 percent AMI and they were all from Amherst, you would go through the seven local preference. You'd go through that that selection, and then you would continue to select for the the remaining three homes. If they're all from Amherst, then yes, they could all be from Amherst. I think so that I think the reality of that is unlikely, but that is the but, answer. No, but I mean that this that that that's why I'm. And if we don't have the local preference, they could still all be from Amherst. Correct. If they live in the now, qualified and, census tract, so I want to be. I want to be clear that when you're yeah, talking yeah. about local preference for Amherst, you're talking again about people who live in the qualified census tract. Right. You're not opening it up to people who live outside this qualified census tract. If you're approving local preference, all you're doing is is bringing up um, Amherst above somebody else who lives in a different qualified census tract. Um, you know, the town of where Greenfield. All right. So what about the what about the hundred percent units? Can they be from any? Well, they has they still have to pass number one and number two. Correct. Uh, and they could live in a qualified census tract in Amherst and they could be a hundred percent AMI and they will be placed in the lottery with everybody else that qualifies under those two top categories. Okay, so it's a lottery after the Southern Affordable. No, no, no. There's there are two there are two lotteries. There's two pools. There's the eighty percent pool and there's the hundred yep. percent pool. And in the hundred percent pool, there is no local preference. Correct. Correct. No local preference. There is in that hundred percent pool of people who are applying for the hundred for hundred percent AMI. There is no local preference, so they only have to meet one and two. There is no three. Okay, it's becoming clear. The reason I'm confused is because I watched the videos for the on the website for Commonwealth Builders, and it looked like the the people who were living in the homeowners units were people who had been previously living in rental units in the same neighborhood. That's that's why I Which get is confused. correct, but those are also communities that have a much higher concentration of people of color than the town of Amherst. These are this is Roxbury. This is city of Boston. That's where Commonwealth yeah. Builders is typically that's where the project active projects are. So yeah. those those are communities with a with a higher percentage of people of color than Amherst. And so Local preference isn't isn't necessarily something that that Commonwealth Builders has not seen local preference yet on a project. This is this is unique to this to this program. That's yeah. why it's taken a long time to get answers because they haven't had to address this yet. Yeah, well that that's that's why I'm confused. Yeah, so they don't have a lo local preference in no. Roxbury, and they're no. all people from the neighborhood. Correct. So that could happen here too. It could. Yeah. It could. Well, I think I think my confusion is settled now. I think I get it. Great. Good. All right. Thank you, Ms. Greenbaum. Um, who else wishes to speak on to this matter? Are there other comments from board members on um, number seven, condition seven? If there's no further discussion, uh, we could have a motion on approving or denying or, or, or not approving the local preference in number seven. Let me just get the language of that. Hold on a second. Steve, Ms. Bestrup has got her hand up. Oh, Ms. Bestrup. Yeah, I ahead. just wanted to note that Mr. Henry is um, kind of here dually. Yeah. He's on the phone. Yeah. And he's also um, on Zoom, but he doesn't have his um, image available. So I wanted to remind him that if he wanted to speak, yes. I don't know if he can raise his hand in 
the condition that he's in. But if he wanted to speak, he should press star nine on the phone. That's all yeah, I wanted to say. Yeah. Thank you. Or Mr. Henry, if you can try to get the, I know this is something that you're very interested in and I don't want to preclude you from having a chance to discuss this. Can you unmute if you wish to discuss? Um, can you not hear there me? There we go. Yep, now we hear you. No. So now, um, the phone gives me continuous audio, but I can see you on my iPad. So I'm very into the discussion. So thank you, though. Okay. So if there's no further discussion on this generally, I would, yes, Mr. White, I would, we can have a motion to approve this and then have discussion on the motion. Uh, so it's not, it's not the end of discussion on this if we go to a motion to approve this. It just restricts the discussion to whether we should approve it or not, but you can discuss all the positive aspects or negative aspects of it. I think we should do that and get into the discussion of the actual condition. So I would entertain a motion that we approve condition seven with a 70% local preference. So um, motion. So is there a second? Second. We have a motion and second. Uh, the vote occurs on the motion. I mean, not, no, the, we have, now it's discussion before we have a vote. Now it's discussion on the motion ahead of us. Um, so Mr. White, you had your hand up and then I'd go to anybody else that wish to, wishes to speak, Mr. White. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. No, I think what really cleared it up for me at least <clears throat> was the correspondence that we have that where we now have firm, um, kind of more firm grasp on the actual numbers to where we know it's gonna be seven units um, that cleared up a lot for me, so I'll be supporting this. Just thank you. You're right. Mr. Henry, I I want to make sure to give you a chance uh, because, because at the last meeting you spoke strongly, felt strongly about this, um, against this, and I want to give you a chance to speak. I did, and, and thank you. Um, my position has not changed. I, I have spent um, more time doing the research on the negative impacts as well as the historical um, situations that has been created um, intentionally and unintentionally because of um, local references. And so um, I, I, my position has not changed. I will not support the local preference, even though it is a small number as clarified by um, valid CDC. Okay. Is there any other, thank you, Mr. Henry. Is there any other comments, discussion? If not, the vote occurs on whether the board will accept condition seven, providing for local preference at 70% of the 80% units, 80% of AMI units. Um, the chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Henry? No. Ms. Greenbaum? Aye. Mr. White? Aye. The vote is four to one um, in favor of condition seven. Uh, so condition seven is adopted. Condition eight dealt with an affirmative fair housing uh, marketing plan. Uh, I, at the last meeting, I expressed some concern that I wanted to make sure that there was a lot of outreach and that there was a outreach that also included information that, prov that provides um, information to potential applicants about a host of programs that can help people qualify for this. There out there, there are, there's down, there's some kind of down payment assistance. There's FA, there's VA, FHA, there's VA, there's some state programs. There's private, there's non-governmental private sector programs. There are not as many as there should be, but some banks and others can provide help to people to meet the financial obligations um, beyond just kind of credit counseling and financial literacy. And I thought it would be important, my concern at the last meeting was, it'd be important to just to list those as things that a marketing plan could include. And I thought it would be helpful to list those. So uh, I like condition eight as amended. You have it in your packet. It's a, you know, it's, Rob, you wanna put up condition eight as amended? Let me just uh, switch around my documents real quick. All right. 
Boolean back. There we go. So this does respond partially to exactly what we talked about at the last meeting. At the last meeting, Ms. Allen said that they are in consultation or co conversation with DBM housing consultants regarding marketing and our villages regarding financial literacy, both of which I think she said were um, women owned companies in Boston. And the only thing I wanted to add to this condition was the following sentence. And I can provide this um, to Rob afterwards, but the following sentence, the marketing plan shall include the provision of information to eligible potential applicants regarding financial assistance available to help them qualify, including FHA, VA, other federal, state, and local programs, down payment assistance, as well as non-governmental assistance. So it wouldn't require that they um, put, they just put, require that they, to the extent that they can, provide the information about other programs that are available to um, potential applicants for the program. So I, I'd throw that out there. I'd like to get um, Ms. Allen's reaction to such, um, inclu it's included but not limited to kind of language. Um, so I'd like to get Ms. Allen's reaction to that. And then we can discuss a potential amendment to condition eight. Sure. I mean, I don't think it does any harm. We would do it anyway. I mean, that's what right. we do. Um, our first time home by our counselor, she knows every pot of money, every good mortgage program. I mean, this is how we get people in homes is by knowing all of the programs. So um, I, I don't have an issue with adding it. I would just want to maybe flag if you're going to list a number of programs that Amherst has a reparations committee that mm -hmm. has already discussed about offering down payment assistance to potential eligible home buyers. And I think it would be of benefit to list that if you're going to list a whole bunch of other programs to list the reparations money as well. That would be great. I mean, that was my um, down payment assistance reference, but I, I didn't specifically mention that one as, a, as opposed to some other one. I'd be happy to put that in as a friendly amendment. I would take that. So both down payment as well as Amherst Reparations Committee down payment assistance. Yes, because I don't think the committee has really decided the process yet is, is the last my last understanding. I think they are still trying to work out those details on who would be eligible and how how it would work. So. Um, you know, without having details of how the actual program works, I think it'd be worth just flagging in there. OK. All right. So I would. Yes, Mr. Henry. I, th I think you're, um, you're, you're frozen, Mr. Henry. Try, try speaking again. Can you not hear me? Now we can. Now I can hear you. Okay. So um, in keeping with Condition 8, I think it's a great idea having this um, resource in there. And my question for Attorney Murray is that I, I do not imagine this will be the last um, affordable home project in Amherst. And I think something that would benefit the town when this comes up again is having some kind of data to say, we did this the last time, here was our pool, and here is um, who applied and how they qualified, did not qualify. The question is, can there be a disclaimer added where Valley CDC shares that data with the town, with, of course, the applicant's consent? Or, or applicant's consent and their identities Protected, I would suspect. Yes. Yeah, right. or, or, or hidden, their identity's hidden. I think you have to, Ms. Allen, I think there's a condition that requires a provision of this kind of information to the town, is there not? I'm sorry, so the question was what? The, that we already have to do this? I, I thought there was a condition that required this kind of information. If they're not, not if I'm not opposed to a condition that would require um, sort of at the end of the, the selection process a report to the town of how the selection process was completed and how it was done sure i don't remember that language being in there i'm sorry attorney murray go ahead no sorry okay. i'm trying to help out <laughs> if i could just jump in 
the applicant is required with respect to the units that are going to go on the subsidized housing inventory. There is a condition in here, you're right, Mr. Chair, yeah. that the applicant is to provide any paperwork necessary for the town to then submit that those units for inclusion on the SHI. I think Mr. Henry's question goes a little bit more broadly, where it sounds like he wants to know how did this outreach actually work? and what kind of results did it actually yield? Um, so that's a little bit more data than we would typically get. But to your point, Mr. Chair, that if the applicant is certainly willing to share their experience with us, um, I would suggest that absolutely, we don't need to know people's identities. Um, we just need to know you marketed, you know, in however many communities, however many newspapers, however many, uh, you know, outreach programs, uh, were conducted and where they might have been conducted. And then out of that, you know, how many people came, how many people actually wound up um, submitting an application, how many of those people perhaps um, ultimately were able to purchase a unit in this project. I would think, I, I certainly don't want to speak for Ms. Allen, <laughs> um, but I would think that that type of data uh, with sensitive information like that redacted um, I think could be helpful for the town for future projects. Yeah. We could we could give Thank some you. broad brush Thank data you. and information, but you know, again, in terms of just personal information and personal income, uh, you know, I think we would want to respect the homeowner's privacy. We don't ask this oh, of yeah. rate buyers, you know, so to to put that, um, but we're happy to provide some broad brush. I think number of applicants, applicants that maybe were qualified, maybe those that weren't qualified, maybe those that started to go through the process and then bailed because of whatever reasons, you know, we're, we're able to provide some of that broad brush information, um, so. Before we have any more comments, I thought, Mr. Henry, would you be willing to write that, just write up what you would like to see as um, a sentence or two, we can come. We can consider it whenever you are, have finished it. If you, you can share it with us, you write up what you would like to have done as, um, and then read it to us. And if it's something that the board agrees to, I think we could incorporate it into the conditions. But I'd like to make sure that it's what you would like to see, and that the board and the applicant and our attorney has kind of looked at it. So I'm inclined to support it but I just want to have the language that's, that's helpful and it's precise. So can you work on that during the course of this meeting and then bring it up to our attention? I, I can, yes. Great, why don't we do that? And then I know there were a couple other comments that were coming, but um, I think Ms. Thibault was gonna speak and Ms. Greenbaum. So Ms. Thibault, did you still wish to speak? Sure, thank you. Um, I just am sensitive to um, too much being asked of Valley CDC, um, particularly with respect to if they provide all of this information, will it then actually be used? Um, you know, if there's not a process already in place for evaluating it, um, you know, it, it sounds like perhaps they're they're willing to do it, but uh, I just hope it's not too extensive and too burdensome for them. Okay. I think if we get some specific language, we can evaluate whether it'd be burdensome or not. And that's, maybe Mr. Henry can provide that clarification through his so, amendment. So the intent is not to make it um, burdensome. And I, and I imagine that um, some of this information will be easily and readily available on a person's application um, in terms of demographics and things that I think would be relevant for future projects. But um, I, I think what I'm getting at is to say, um, we just approved local preference and it would be nice to see how or if that actually worked for next project development and how many people, if possible, didn't qualify as a result or did qualify as a result. Okay. And of course, yeah, and, and of course, um, again, with just trying to gain some perspective in terms of how we outreach people and who were targeted and from that outreach, how successful it was. And again, 
This is meant to be for improving what we do, not meant to burden. Okay. I, I will like to respond a little bit in that the the affirmative fair housing marketing plan actually does set very specific information about what newspapers were marketing in, our target audiences, radio stations. I mean, it's pretty detailed in terms of mm -hmm. the marketing plan. So that has to get approved by Mass Housing. And we're happy to share that with the town once it's been approved by the state agency so that you can see what we're doing. Um, so I just want to note that that's already going to be accomplished in terms of our marketing strategy in that plan. Okay, so thank you. So that's already in place. Thank you. Yep. Ms. Greenbaum. Yes, I, I wholeheartedly support this uh, proposal by Mr. Henry because I have wanted to know all these years for the amount of tax money Amherst people are spending on affordable housing whether we're actually providing housing for people who live and work here. Because on the globe every single day, there's you know feedback from the towns on the, on the MBTA that don't wanna do their fair share and we're doing more than our fair share. And so I have wanted to make sure that we are benefiting by spending what little land that we have left that's buildable uh, and submitting not you know our tax money in various categories um, on affordable housing that our needs are being met because I get the impression that our needs are not getting met no matter how much we keep building and uh, I think this is good information to have if only for political propaganda so I I would push to okay. support this. So that makes sense. So let's do this. Um, Mr. Henry is going to come up with a condition or an amendment to a condition. We'll vote on it when he when he can relate it to us. Um, but what I'd like to do is just take condition eight, approve condition eight as with, and I'd like to put the amendment as amended by um, the inclusion of Amherst reparations down payment assistance before the uh, committee, uh, the board and um, approve condition eight as amended uh, by my um, by my sentence. And if you want me to read it again, I will. But I think you all know what I was what I was doing. So I would entertain a motion to approve condition eight as amended to also include the amendment suggested by Ms. Allen about Amherst uh, reparate to include the Amherst reparations down payment assistance program. Do I have such a motion? So moved. And, I have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? If not, the vote occurs on approving condition eight as amended. Chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. White? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. And Ms. Greenbaum? Aye. All right, the vote was five to nothing. Um, that's been approved. So condition eight is, as amended has been approved. And again, when Mr. Henry comes up with something, we'll, we'll take it up right away. Um, 9, 11, and 12 have already been approved. Now we move to uh, Part B in the uh, conditions. Part B is basically utility conditions. I would just, I'd like to deal with from condition 13 to condition 19. And they're basically, what all of them say, in essence, is you got to do what the town says you have to do. You got to abide by the rules of the town, um, and your the applicant is required is responsible for providing the information, providing all the approvals for the uh, contained in this decision. Um, it simplified some of the um, requirements that were in the doesn't list the specific fees. It talks about the stormwater features that a, uh, the pro, uh, the project shall not hold water for more than seventy two hours. They say that there's for twenty four hours. And the applicant, when applicable, the homeowners association shall comply with the operations and management plan for the on-site stormwater system. That is the one new, I mean, substantively new provision, uh, new condition that included in conditions 13 through 19. Um, is there any discussions about conditions 13 through 19? Yes. Well, let it on the, the screen for a little bit so people can uh, digest it. Mr. Meadows. Uh, I, I'm not certain where to add it or how, but I would like to add something 
that indicates as as all building projects go, there's always something that goes askew. And if there are changes necessary to the as a result of conditions that are found during construction or just prior to it, that there be some way to modify this so that we don't have to come back here to do a modification. So I think that's a really good point. And I think there is a provision, there is a provision here, which I'm looking to find a condition that allows the building commissioner to make those, and it specifically lists the kinds of, uh, okay, if you look at chair, is that number 26? 26, it's 26. Mr. Meadows, take a look at condition 26. We're going to get to that in a second. I think that might resolve your problem, but I'm not sure. So if it doesn't, we can we can deal with your issue at, when we get to condition 26, okay? Very good. All right, that's a good point. So again, anything from 13 to 19, any con questions, concerns, amendments? All right, I think this is, these are all pretty straightforward. So I would entertain a motion to approve conditions 13 to 19 as contained in the draft ap project application report. Do I have such a motion? So moved. So, okay. And I have a second, it sounds like, in the screen bomb. Yes. Any further discussion? If not, I, I, go I, ahead. I, yep, Mr. I, Mr. Meadows. Yeah, but. I, I'm a little confused by 18. Okay. Uh, it, it says that it shall not hold water for more than 72 hours, and yet indicates that uh, in the event that water collects for more than 72 hours. Hmm. So uh, it seems to be a contradiction right there. Oh. So what it says is that if it does hold it longer than that, they have to they have to have um, mosquito yes, control right. efforts. So, but it says that the stormwater features shall not are just designed, but shall not hold water. Um, it's not that they're designed not to hold water, but they shall not hold water for more than seventy-two hours. I guess um, just to clarify, it looks like in the event for whatever reason that there's some catastrophe or downpour that the stormwater system in like a freak 100 year rainstorm can't go within 72 hours they have to do that anyways is right, that but it should it should read shall be designed so as not to hold water for more yeah. than 72 hours okay and you want that in the first sentence right you want the first sentence yeah. to be amended okay yes yeah I'm sure Attorney Murray is writing this down as we're speaking. And since the the design is to hold it for 24, I think it's um, the design as we've seen it should meet that requ the requirements of the amendment that Mr. Meadows has proposed. Mr. Chair, um, I don't mean to interrupt, but uh, just to correct something you mentioned in this motion. For 24 um, hours? For se uh, no, 72. No. Um, just to correct something. So these are not being taken from the draft project application report. They're being taken from the draft uh, decision document. You know, you're, at, you're exactly right. You're yeah. exactly right, Rob. Sorry. Thank you for, yeah. thank you for correcting me on that. These are taken from the, the decision document that uh, Ms. Murray put together for us. Ms. Greenbaum. I have an issue with the applicant shell implement necessary mosquito control measures number one because it's controversial and number two because we are planting all kinds of native species to encourage butterflies and other kinds of insects and that sentence bothers me as being con well being against what we're trying to do with that land by putting in native species and encouraging bugs. But I would you, I, I think the issue is shell. If you want to keep it there, you you might 
if you want to keep the mosquito control in there, you could maybe say, if necessary, may implement. But then we got a, a decision. I mean, then we're leaving it up to the decision. You know, I, I, I'm not sure that mosquito control measures adversely affect um, pollinators and other um, insects. They mostly affect those that are hatching their um, hatching their offspring in the water in stale in stagnant water. Um, and I'm not an aqua biologist or marine biologist, but I don't think they have effects on bees and pollinators and others. And so I and I do think that it's it is a real problem if you have standing water for 72 hours and mosquitoes start to come and it becomes a problem for the residents. And this will have to be, this would be a decision that, you know, would be made by the, um, the management team of the residents, of the owners of the, the, the association as to when they have to put this down there, they have to comply with the, the conditions. But I think that if it becomes a, a situation where um, they find that it's not necessary, they can always come and see if they can get this changed or um, see if they, at a public meeting, see if this condition poses a burden to them or is unhealthy. So well, I'm, I'm, I'm not so, so sure I want to mess with this because I do think mosquito control is important. Well, but I, I don't want spraying. Yeah, well, I, 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 I agree with Hilda. You agree with Hilda? Well, you, you're a pollinator guy, Mr. Meadows. You know about, you, know. You, you've been a, you've brought us, maybe I'm wrong as to what the effect of mosquito, those donuts we throw in, in water, and stagnant waters that's supposed to uh, keep the the water um, from not produ from producing mosquitoes. If that affects pollinators and bees and others, it can. Okay, Mr. White. Um, so this is actually something that I can speak to in pretty good detail, as I'm from Hurricane Alley. Um, so and also just mosquito land. Uh, <laughs> so in situations like this, uh, the kind of action that's been taken by other states has been to look at kind of what is more of a dire concern. Um, the way that I've always seen it come down is that the immediate health that is much more likely to go south, but just posed by mosquitoes, is far more detrimental than any possible damage that might occur due to pollinators or indigenous plant life. So that's the way that kind of, at least in my, in my past that I've seen it dealt with, and it's been dealt with on pretty much an annual basis in uh, Wilmington, North Carolina. Um, so I would want to keep something in there because of course this depends on which chemical compounds you would be using. You know, there are a lot of things that aren't in the language, um, but mm -hmm the immediate health risk that could be posed by disease-borne pathogens from exposure to mosquitoes would pose, in my opinion, uh, far more of a detriment than any potential damage to pollinators and or bees. Other comments, Mr. Um, well, Ms. Greenbaum and then Mr. Wachilla. Oh. Oh, Mr. Wachilla. I want to second what Philip said because I also grew up in a warmer climate on the Delmarva Peninsula, uh, bigger mosquitoes than New England. But I think one thing to keep in mind is that, you know, if you have these mosquito breeding nests, so it could usually, you know, it could be the standing water in a pond or it could be somebody's pool that they haven't cleaned in two or three days or even longer than that, maybe like a week. I mean, the mosquito breeding nests do pose health risks for residents who live near them. As mosquitoes tend to carry a lot of pathogens that aren't really, you don't really want to see that in large concentrations from these mosquito nests that would be created near residential units, um, specifically since this detention basin is going to be so close to a bunch of houses. So, I mean, that's something else to keep in mind as well as a possible health and safety concern if, if you were to take out this condition specifically. Okay, I think we've heard from four of the five members. So the question is really whether this is a mandatory or a discretionary application of necessary mosquito control measures. 
And I, so to be fair to, to the, um, to Ms. Greenbaum and Mr. Meadows, I would entertain a motion that we approve condition 18. So we approve all these conditions, including condition 18 as amended by striking, no, I'm, excuse me, I'm gonna say this again. I would entertain a motion that we approve condition 18 with the amendment that the applicant shall or may implement as opposed to shall implement out that um, necessary mosquito control measures. And that way we get a vote on whether we want the may or the shell language in there. If that amendment, if that motion fails, then we'll go back and try to approve the motion as it currently stands. Is everybody clear on how we should go about this so we have the question of shell decided, shell or may decided? So we are voting on a motion that says the applicant may implement. That's right. I would vote on it. We have before us a vote on a motion that the applicant may. And if that fails, then we'll be we'll go back and see if the applicant shall. All right. And and what is this? Three out of five. Three out of five. I mean, the other the simplest way to do this is to amend the motion by replacing may with shall or shall with may. That's the simplest way to do this. That's that's an even better way. So let me take back what I said. The best way to do this is that there's an amendment before us to replace the word shall with the word may on the second second sentence in condition 18. Do I have such a motion? Uh, so we more. also have we also have the the first sentence amendment. Right. And I think that's I think that is um, consensus. We'll I'll, I'll put that. I like to have that as a separate issue because I think that's a consensus, Craig. I think everybody will agree with it. shall be designed. Okay. Yep. Um, do I have such a motion? Yes, so move. Second. Okay. All right, moved and seconded, time for discussion. Mr. White. Um, my only concern with that is if, if we change shall, which is a directive terminology to may, then they may not right. just as easily as they may. So at that point, what is the point of having the condition? I also, I come from Minnesota where the state bird is a mosquito and it's, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it, it is not only uh, bothersome, but it is, it's their danger. They do transmit diseases. And um, so I'm, I'm inclined, I am not going to support the motion to strike shell and insert thereof, in lieu thereof may. So that's my position. Uh, Mr. Meadows. I'm from Massachusetts. I grew up here and out locally, and uh, I, I'm in favor of May because that leaves it up to the applicant, which is the residents, to make a decision at the time that this may happen, uh, as opposed to mandating that they have to do something, uh, and it and they're the ones who are living there. Got it. And Ms. Greenbaum, I think we know yes. where you stand. I'm I'm supporting Craig for the same reasons I was going to say because you know it's always controversial when the state decides helicopters are going to fly over we and air spray and people get very very upset. They don't want the the chemicals in the air, and they don't want to subject. They think the chemicals are more dangerous than whatever pathogens there may be, and I think there should be local discretion on this. All right, Mr. Henry. Just say people who live there, let them have some say in whether they want to be sprayed or not sprayed. Mr. Henry? I'm just trying to make sure I understand. Is, is this a condition being asked? Are we considering this condition to be imposed on valid CDC or on the residents? This is a condition that would be imposed on the, the, the property hub even after Valley CDC has exited and when it just okay. owns the owners of the property. Okay. And, and what is Valley's position now on shall versus may? We haven't heard from Valley. Ms. Allen, do you have a position on this? Um, I mean, I see both sides of the, of the coin on this. I'm fine with May. I think I think the um, members who make a good point that it's going to be up to the homeowners to decide. I mean, the fact is that these stormwater basins have been designed to drain 
in less than 72 hours. So again, it's a scenario that might be very rare. Um, and let's leave it up to the residents to decide when the time comes on how to best manage the situation. Okay. Mr. Henry, do you have further comments? Is, is there any mechanism where um, a bit of a hybrid where now um, Valley takes on that responsibility and do something um, to safeguard this issue now, but later give the residents the option, or is it something once it's done, it's permanent? The board of directors of the condo association, and you know, maybe Rebecca can even speak to this and how things are drafted, but there's rules and regulations, there's bylaws, and so some of these documents are can be changed at their annual meeting. Um, if they decide to, in one year, decide to change how they're going to deal with a situation like this, they can address that as part of the condo association and the board of managers. I would add one other thing in reading through the second pair, second sentence. The applicant shall implement any necessary mosquito control measures as reasonably determined by the applicant to protect residents of the project and nearby residents in the event. So yeah. you already have um, within this condition the ability for the, the uh, homeowners association to say it's not necessary or it's not, reason it's not a reasonable thing to ask us to do this because it, either they aren't that just because water is there for 72 hours, if there are no mosquitoes, if there's no danger, I don't read this as saying they have to have, even with a the shell, they shall implement any necessary, that's a qualification, and as reasonably determined by the applicant, which will be the board of directors of the homeowners association. So I think even with the word shell, we have some discretion on the part of the homeowners association to act as this is currently written. So why have the word shell? There's no well, reason for it. It, shall, it requires them to make a decision, I think, Craig, is what it, Mr. Meadows, I think well, that's what it does. Yeah. So I, I wanted to point out that this is, that it's implemented as reasonably be determined by the applicant. So we're not going to be part of this development that's once we sell the homes. So we're not going to be, you know, we'll be there for a portion of the time until we yeah. have the project completely completed. But the sentence almost doesn't make sense, given the nature of these homes are going to be sold. You're putting the burden on us to protect residents of the project and nearby residents. But we're not part of this project anymore once we've sold all the homes. I mean, we it's can solve that problem by the language in the next in the next um, condition. The applicant and when applicable the homeowners association we could just, that could just follow the applicant in each place and that would solve that problem but you point out a good point you, you know the applicant isn't going to be here in three years hopefully you'll be you'll be out of the business and it's the homeowners association right well listen you know i we're spending a lot of time on a really nasty little bug and i and i think that um i i, I think we're we're spending too much time on this so what I would like to do is it, we've got at least two and maybe three people who are who are willing to um, insert may instead of shell. I'm not going to follow my sword or my um, on, on the mosquitoes proboscis, so to speak, on this one. And I will um, I will vote for the may just so that we can move on because I don't want to I don't want to spend a lot of time on mosquitoes here in this. And I would also um, support adding the language from the from condition 19 the applicant when applicable the homeowners association and so we clear that clarify that up so i think that's mr white i uh, mean your north carolina experience may not comport, comport with that but I, i'd like to move on and not spend more time on this so i would um entertain we've got a motion before us i'd like to have a friendly amendment to that motion before us to add the words applicant and when applicable the homeowners association so we, it's clarified as to um, who actually this applies to and have the word shell and um, at that point is it, and as well as mr meadows earlier amendment um, to be designed that after the word shell in the first sentence be designed not to hold water so those three amendments this provision would be before us in the motion that we're going to consider next and that is um, 
to approve 18 with those changes. So does everybody understand where we're at? Yes. All right. So that's the motion before us. Um, do I have any, is there any further discussion? If not, the motion, the vote occurs on the motion to adopt 18 with the changes of adding to be designed with the changes of deleting shell and inserting in lieu thereof may and with the inserting after the word applicant and when applicable, the homeowners association comma um, in that provision. Mr. Everald Henry has his hand up. Yes, Mr. Henry. Oh, I'm sorry. It's been there for a while. I, I already spoke. Yep, got it. Ms. Thiebaud, I mean, unless you have something to add to this. Uh, sorry, just quickly, I think this might be relevant to this condition and um, later on conditions. When you see applicant and want to substitute homeowners association that is addressed by the comprehensive condition in 69 which says once this permit is trans once the homeowners association takes over any references to the applicant will mean the homeowners association oh that's good to know that, thank you i, I missed you. that that will save us some all right it doesn't change this motion before us i don't want to go back over it again so we're going to have the vote on this motion unless there's any further discussion the chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows. Aye. Mr. White. Aye. Mr. Henry. Aye. And Mr. Uh, Ms. Ms. Greenbaum. Aye. Motion is, uh, carries, the vote is five to nothing. All right, so now we wanna go back to um, conditions 13 through 19 um, not including 18, which you've already asked. And I would entertain a motion to um, approve conditions 13 through 17 and 19. Do I have such a motion? So moved. So moved. Uh, it's moved and Ms. Greenbaum seconds it. Is there any further discussion? If not, the vote occurs on motions, on conditions um, 13 through 17 and 19. The chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. White? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Ms. Greenbaum? Aye. Great. Um, we're gonna do conditions 20 through 24, and then we're gonna take a five minute break, and we're gonna come back and with extra energy, I think we'll be able to continue plowing through this. So conditions uh, 20, 21, 22, 23, and 24 are generally um, relating to the operation and maintenance and the stormwater, um, as well as some utilities. And then there's a, another condition 24 is, if it's not completed within 24 months um, the, of the first building permit, that shall be submitted to the board and the building commissioner. A construction schedule shall be submitted, which is sort of a check on to make sure that this is getting done. So number one deals with parking to prevent stormwater. Number two deals with the issuing of a building permit, but it only happens after stormwater management system has been reviewed by the town engineer. And I think you've submitted the up of the O&M plan, but just hasn't been reviewed yet, right, Ms. Allen? I'm sorry, I had to step away for a second. Uh, That's okay. So for yeah. number 21 requires that the O&M plan for the um, uh, stormwater is, has to be approved by the engineer. You already have, have submitted one. I don't yeah, know it approved. was approved by the Conservation Commission and it was submitted to the town engineer as part of that CONCOM permitting process. So it it's, it's just hasn't been approved by him yet. So it's still there. Okay. Relative shallow depth to groundwater shall require public works inspection. Okay and all utilities shall be underground to the maximum extent possible. And if construction is not completed within 24 months from the issuance of the first building permit, construction schedule shall be submitted to the board and the building commissioner. Are there any concern, or any, is there any discussion about those um, five conditions, 20 through 24? If not, I would entertain a motion that we approve conditions 20 through 24. So I have a motion. So moved. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded that motions, uh, conditions 20 through 24 be approved. 
There's no further discussion. The vote occurs on that motion. The chair votes aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Ms. Greenbaum? Aye. Mr. White? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. All right. The motion passes. The vote's five to nothing and the motion passes. So um, let's take a five minute, a five minute uh, break. I have the time at 741. Let's come back here at 746 and we can continue on our merry way along conditions and uh, then findings. Thank you. Thank you. We are all set. All right, time 748, we've reconvened. Um, we're moving on to um, section C, which are site improvements, conditions. I would propose we take up conditions 25 through 29. Um, they all deal with, you know, in essence, the site improvements and some of the things that Mr. Meadows spoke to about the ability of the building commissioner to uh, accommodate minor and substantial changes that may occur once you get onto the building site, uh, it lists them. So the first thing deals with, um, I do have a request for what the yellow language means in 25. And either Ms. Murray or Ms. Brestrup, can you tell me what the highlighted language in number 25 means? Certainly, Mr. Chair. Uh, so ordinarily, um, I would have stopped this sentence at Exhibit B. Okay. Um, that we make it clear that applicant has to comply with local bylaws unless you know any sort of waivers have been granted. Um, I think we did have some discussion a little bit um, when we were actually looking at the waiver set that there was some sense that maybe there should be a little bit of um, uh, flexibility just in case something should change or need to be changed and it was reflected, you know, on the plans somehow, but just hadn't quite yet been captured in a specific waiver um, listed in the table of waivers. So I think this highlighted language came in as a result of that. Um, so that essentially you grant the waivers as laid out in the Exhibit B, that schedule, mm -hmm. or to the extent that any of the approved plans contain some sort of variation, um, the plans are going to control. So if your building commissioner at some point two years from now is trying to read through 69 conditions and the waivers and look at the plans and figure out what actually controls what's going to be shown on the approved plan set will actually control. Got it. So what we've seen, what's been, what's been submitted to us controls and the plan set. Got it. Okay, thank you. Um, 26 deals with all the ability the ability of the building commissioner to deal with um, insubstantial sh uh, changes or non-significant changes or modifications, many of which are kind of on the ground conditions that develop. Uh, Ms. Brestrup, I see your hand is up. Thank you. Yeah, I had a question about number uh, 26B because I noticed that um, the material that was submitted by Valley CDC for this meeting included um, the light fixture that had been proposed last fall. And then um, Ms. Greenbaum um, objected to that light fixture because she thought it was too modern. So on December 7th, um, Valley CDC uh, proposed another light fixture that was a little bit more traditional in style. Um, but I don't remember what the outcome of that discussion was. I thought that the board liked that more traditional light fixture. Um, but yet the more modern one appears in the set of plans that you're being asked to approve tonight. So I just wanted to have some clarification about that. What exactly is being proposed and does the board approve of the light fixture that's shown on the plans tonight? Um, Rob, can you th throw up what's, what's on the plans, the light fixture that's on the plans? Yeah, that'll take me a few minutes, Mr. Chair, so just uh, bear with me for one second. So while you do that, this is not something I care a lot about. I think it's up, it could be up to the the, um, the board if people really care about light fixtures, the, the design of the light fixtures, as long as it complies with the dark sky compliant um, provisions of our, 
of our bylaws, I'm not going to impose my judgment on that. So I'll leave it up to others on the board if they really wish to um, manage which how the the design of the light fixtures. I think the I'll leave it up to the architects and and, just, and, the, and the board members if they really if people feel strongly about it. But I I don't want to spend the, a lot of my energy on that. Ms. Bresco. Ms. Greenbaum was the one who had the objection to yeah. the more modern light fixture, so I wondered if she had any comments about um, the one that's shown on the plan tonight. Well, and I thought they looked very commercial for a residential development. So these are the two uh, that I saw. So we have this one. And then we have this one over here. And then these are two types of luminaire bollards that they're putting down. Um, but were you talking about the 14 foot lights? Ms. Yes. Yes. Those, the, those are the ones you were talking about is the, is the lights were the ones on the parking lot. Yeah. What look, look, look like Big Y. I wish Big Y had that nice. In the packet for um, December 7th, the other lights were shown and they were specifically, there was a, a document in that packet that oh. was specifically about lighting. So I just wondered if you wanted to look at that and make a decision about, do you want to, yeah. what do you want to say about that? If, if I may, um, you know, I think what we had brought up earlier was that if the board wanted to decide to change lighting fixtures, we would need to rerun a photometrics plan to make sure that those photo that the light fixtures actually still meet the photometric standards for the town, which is why we provided this information in December. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm a um, I'm a little hesitant to start switching things around now to because I just feel like it's going to continue to delay uh, well, our permitting okay. process here. I thought we did that. I no. thought that you, you you submitted it and they came back and said it was the same. We never discussed it again. We submitted it and it was never brought up again. So the language B provides the building commissioner with the ability to approve substitution of lighting fixtures if they have equivalent or better performance and provided resulting sub substitution shall be dark side compliant. Um, so that's what's in currently there. And I mean, if, if um, Valley CDC, or if there's a strong feeling on the part of the board that there ought to be a different lighting fixture, then it, at, subsequent to this, they would have to do a, uh, we approve a different lighting fixture. They would have to come up with a lighting plan, present that to the building commissioner. And the, uh, even under this existing provision, the building commission would have to decide that it was um, e equivalent or better than the light that was in the original plan. So the, yeah, that's, it, that's what's there before us. So I guess the vote here, the, the question before us is that do we want to, uh, do we want to substitute our judgment on what's a better looking light and then require Valley CDC to run another a photo, photometric study to prove to the building commissioner that the other light is as good, um, provides as good a dark sky compliance as the one they proposed. That's the question for us. Mr. Wachilla. If, if it's okay, Mr. Chair, I wanted to just, so I did look at the rules and regs of the zoning board and I guess requirements for any sort of lighting plan that the board typically looks at when reviewing and approving these types of plans. And it doesn't really seem to focus much at all on aesthetics or, well, it does focus on aesthetics if it's within a certain area where you see similar types of lighting, but it seems like the majority of the focus is solely on functionality and whether the lights are dark sky compliant and or downcast. And also if, you know, it prevents light trespass. So I would caution the board to focus more on those aspects over style. Um, just just from what I've noticed in the rules and regs of the zoning board, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. And do we have a picture? I mean, I'd like to 
dispose of this quickly, but I'd, I, I wonder if we have a, a, um, a representation or a slide that shows the, the alternative lighting fixture from could, December 7th. I could pull that up real quick. Again, I need another minute or so. Um, I have it right here, Rob, if you want me to pull oh, it up. That'd Please be, be my guess. Okay. Um, so it's 33 pages, this submittal. Um, this was one light fixture that was being proposed. It's got more of a kind of standard traditional lantern style, but still has kind of that modern vibe to it, um, which I think the design team we we met and discussed and we all, we all liked this one. Um, this is all the specs associated with it, if anybody really wanted to get into it. And then this was another one that was selected. This is a Maya post top. Um, again, you know, residential scale. Um, I believe the landscape architect had seen this style of light in other residential developments in Amherst. Um, I'd have to dig for that email, but she did find that and send photos. Um, so this was the other the other option that we were proposing. Again, I just want to even note that these may be available today, but two years from now, when we go to construct, these, these um, specific fixtures may not be available. There has been supply chain issues on electrical and lighting fixtures specifically. Um, that has been an ongoing challenge in all of our development projects. So even if we commit to, to this today, I think what's important is, again, as you noted, that photometrics plan, we are not going outside the boundaries of the property. Um, and if we do need to change fixtures, we do have the ability within the decision to, to meet with the building commissioner to review and make sure that he's okay with the standards and that they're equivalent to um, the, light, um, the light candles that are being proposed here, so. And the ones that are circled are the one on this, the, the ones that have the squiggly lines around them are the ones that you're proposing currently that are on the site plans, correct? Yes. So these were these were the alternatives yeah. that we were proposing that we provided to the board in January or in these are the alternatives. Yep. In okay. Ms. Greenbaum, do you want to um, require a different change or different light fixture or not? Um, I, I like I, that. I like that one with um, it looked like the lantern, but I'm not going to fight you. I'll abstain. Yeah, let's let's let them. I mean, my feeling is we go ahead without uh, describing exactly the like fixture that they have to have to put there. But I'm sure they have your they have your concerns in mind and they know about them. So um, I prefer not to have a vote on this if we can. All right. Are there other questions about conditions 25 through 29? So the, the other, the new language is, is I, which says that it has the, uh, gives the ability for the homeowners association to have a future communities facility, but it's limited to 3,500 square feet because that's the amount of impervious area that the um, stormwater plan says can be accommodated. And 29 is new. Um, it seems to me that that just de deals with um, having to have a review of what is now covered land that is now covered by um, a cement slab and they haven't been able to go in and look and see if it's um if there's any environmental uh, problems associated with that land that's currently covered okay if there's no further discussions on numbers 20 through 25 through 29 i would entertain a motion that we approve conditions 25 through 29. So moved, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Henry. Is there a second? Second. It's moved and seconded. If there's any, if there's no further discussion, the vote occurs on 25 through 29 conditions. Um, chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows. Aye. Mr. White. Aye. Mr. Henry. Aye. Ms. Greenbaum. Aye. All right, thank you. And thank you, Ms. Greenbaum. Um, 
the next the next ones I'd like to consider are from are a larger number from 30 to 42. In looking through these, most of these are boilerplate. We have done a lot of in in big construction projects. We typically do things like this, which requires um, it, it lays out the time of notice. It lays out construction timelines that have to be approved by the building commissioner. It lays out the logistics plan, telling when they can be construction between the hours of seven and seven. That Saturday has to have um, uh, no no jackhammering and no ex, no ex, um, explosives. Um, it deals with having um, trying to keep mud and stuff inside the construction area and try to protect the the construction area from um, leaking onto the uh, into the waterway around the to the, to the wetlands. It deals with um, controlling dust and um, having barriers in place to provide tree protection for the trees. And it deals with um, having to wash the tires each day at the end of the workforce. All these are things that are pretty standard and pretty typical. Um, and so I, I had no questions about this. I don't know if anybody on the board does. And I'll give you just a minute to roll through it if you've not already had a chance to run through these, these conditions. Okay, so if anybody has a, any discussion around this, otherwise- Mr. Chair, you yep. said to condition 42, correct? Right, to condition okay. 42, dealing with stumps. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, I would entertain a motion that we approve conditions. Um, excuse me, conditions. 43, or excuse me, conditions 30 through 42. Do I have such a motion? So moved. Is there a second? second. Moved and seconded. No further discussion. If there is no further discussion, the vote occurs on approving conditions 30 through 42. Uh, the chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows. Aye. Mr. Henry. Aye. Mr. White. Aye. Ms. Greenbaum. Aye. The vote is five to nothing. To nothing. Conditions 30 through 42 are approved. The next, I, I would group together conditions 43 through 49. Generally, they deal with post-construction. Um, let's just want, review those quickly. So exterior lighting says it has to be um, downcast according to the, the plant the photo photoelectric lighting photometric lighting plan the project shall provide snow storage that's in this plan set shall provide amenities as shows in the plan set town engineer shall inspect the construction of internal driveways paved areas etc uh, as on the plan set and to it has to protect any town owned properties um, and that's up to the the building commissioner to make that determination. 60 days following the project's construction, the, the applicant shall provide an ads built plan. Again, this is all pretty much boilerplate and standard. Um, and the certificate of occupancy for the final unit shall not be issued until the final top coat of paving and hard surfaces for all driveways, access areas, and walkways have been completed. Landscaping is shown when the approved plan has been completed. An as built plan has been submitted to the building commissioner. I think these are all pretty standard and non controversial. Um, is there any discussion regarding numbers, conditions 43 through 50 through 49? Mr. Chair, if I could add something yes. about condition 47. So yep. it talks about um, the board authorizing the building commissioner to acquire the posting of a surety bond to cover the cost of such impact. Um, usually that's if a project um, could be detrimental. It's more of like an insurance policy the town would require on the construction company to make sure if anything is damaged that it could be paid for. Um, just want to throw that out there. And that's why um, this condition is so important. 
but yeah. otherwise these are general standard construction practice um, and tidying up to get the certificate of occupancy type of conditions you'd see. And that so the requirement for the thirty bond is at the discretion of the building commissioner. It's not a it's not mandated, right? The board authorizes nope. the building commissioner to require if he nope. so chooses. Right? Yep. That, so that's only if the building commissioner sees it as necessary. Right. All right. If there's no discussion, thank you, Rob. If there's no discussion, um, the vote occurs on the motion to approve conditions forty three through forty nine. The chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows. Excuse me, did someone oh, make aye. that motion? Yeah, we I need to make the motion. I don't think oh. anyone made the motion yet. I think you oh, thank you. you had a motion on 30 to 42, <laughs> but you didn't have a motion on 43 to 49 yet. I'll make that motion then. <laughs> okay. All right. And Mr. White Second. seconds. So we've got a motion made and, and uh, seconded. Any discussion? If there's no discussion, the vote occurs on the motion, which I'm which thank you, Ms. Prescott, that we've now made. Um, chair votes aye. Mr. White? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Ms. Greenbaum? Aye. What is five to nothing? The motion carries. Next, deal with landscaping numbers 50 to 53. Uh, we've talked about this before. Um, the first is that it's, it's got to be in accordance with the plan. The second is that the assignment of the homeowners association upon assignment of the, of the uh, permit for the homeowners association shall maintain the landscaping. Anything that, something that is common, it's any species that does not, or example that does not survive has to be replaced by a similar species. Um, the applicant of the homeowner shall not use, uh, shall use natural herbicides and all mat mature trees found within the Project site as shown on the approved plan set, plan set shall be um, maintained. And it, it, it basically says you got to do what's on the landscaping plan. Is there any questions about the landscaping section conditions 50 through 53? If there's no discussion on items on conditions 50 to 53. I'd entertain a motion to approve conditions 50 to 50 through 53. Do I so have some moved. Mr. Meadows moves. Second. The screen bomb seconds. Is there any discussion? If there's no discussion, the vote occurs. The chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows. Aye. Ms. Greenbaum. Aye. Mr. Henry. Aye. Mr. White. Aye. The motion carries five to nothing. The next is parking and circulation. We ought to deal with, I would propose we deal with conditions 53, or actually, I think it's 54, I misread mm -hmm. it. 54 through uh, 50, Six. 56. 59, 56, 54 through 56. So it's 58 parking spaces. Here's the issue that uh, came up, Mr. Meadows, on the electron and the uh, EV boards. Um, this allows, as I read this, this allows them to go forward with the current plan, and then ask the state for a variance. Uh, and if they get the variance, um, then they can have a, a different plan than is currently in the, um, required by the state. I think that's the way this reads. Is that right, Ms. Murray? Am I, or am I mistaken in this case? No, you, you are correct, Mr. Chair. So that they either comply with the building code, or the stretch energy code, or with any variance that might be granted by the state. And if I could also just point out, there was just a, a lingering comment or question for the board. Um, at one point, there had been some discussion about a parking management plan, um, but I don't know that we've come to any kind of consensus as to whether or not you want to require that of the applicant. Um, well, for, okay, so first of all, we have the the very the request the need for the variance or the ability for them to go to the variance and if the variance is approved that is the building commissioner can incorporate that into the into the uh, permit on the mat the parking management plan i think that should be up to the homeowners association to submit a parking management plan at a, a later point in time and submit that to the building commissioner and if he feels that that's sufficient he can approve it if not you can come before the board at a public meeting is that 
Is that taken care of here, Mr. Wachilla? So if there was a management plan submitted with the application, there should be a section there that uh, covers this. And that's pretty far back we'd have to dig. Um, I don't have access to my files for the permit that far back. Um, but I guess we could ask Ms. Allen if when the management plan was submitted, did you um, include a section on parking management? Uh, let me just look at the application packet. We filled out the required form on management. Mm -hmm. I have to find it. Um, I believe you also did the additional. The, I think you left it up to the building, the homeowners association. I think there's also a condition in there that references it, that it's part yep. of, that that's the home, the homeowners think, association, if I remember I correctly. I think it's Article 65. Parking shall be enforced and mandated in accordance with the parking management plan to be determined by the homeowners association. Correct. Yeah, I rem I thought I remembered seeing that in there. Okay, so Perfect. those will be in the um that will be in the uh the bylaws. I'm assuming then parking enforcement for the site. Okay. All right. Okay, so we've got fifty four through fifty five. Of course, we'll take out the parenthetical you know, question for the board. Um, do I have a motion to approve conditions fifty four through fifty six? So moved. Second. Deleting the, the parenthetical. Yep. We're deleting the parenthetical. Uh, so it's moved, and I thought I heard a second from Mr. Meadows. Um, if there's no further discussion, the vote occurs on the motion. The chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. White? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. And Ms. Greenbaum? Aye. Great. Motion carries five to nothing. The next are signs. We've got three. These are, you know, straightforward. Uh, they should be reflective. Identification to be shown on the approved set plan and wayfinding signs as appropriate locations to direct postal carriers, and delivery people, et cetera, to the individual sheds and mailboxes. Is there any discussion regarding conditions 57, 58, and 59? If there is not, I would entertain a motion to approve conditions 57, 58, and 59. So moved. Mr. Madden and Ms. Greenbaum seconds. If there's no further discussion, the vote occurs on the motion. The chair votes aye. Ms. Greenbaum? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. White? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Vote is um, five to nothing. The motion carries. Um, the next is the is other section that deals with building plans. Um, I would deal with similarly similar issues in 60, 61, and 62, and 63. This again deals with building plans. Has to meet, the building commissioner has to, has to enforce the building plans. Six of the two bedroom story homes are designed to meet group 2A accessibility standards. This has all been laid out in earlier plans from the applicant. The exception of these six units, they should be um, visible, visitable, visitable by persons with mobility impairments. It outlines what that is. And number 63 is other, unless otherwise allowed by the building commissioner, the state building code, or other, unless otherwise allowed, the use of low flow plumbing fixtures in residential units and non-residential spaces shall be required. Are there any questions about these three conditions? Four conditions, 60, 61, 62, and 63. If not, I'd entertain a motion to approve those four conditions. So moved. So moved. Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve conditions 60 through 63. Um, if there's no further discussion, the chair votes aye. Ms. Greenbaum, you moved it? Aye. <laughs> Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. White? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Vote is five to nothing, the vote carries. The next I would propose we deal with 64 through 72. 64, it's, it's kind of a, hodgepodge of a bunch of different things, but at one deals with central trash being uh, set up as on the approved plan set. 
The next deals with the parking management plan with the homeowners association has to um, come up with that. And I think that means that it has to be approved by the building commissioner because we don't have a, a plan at present, correct? That, that's what, how I would read this. All right, we could, we could add some language in there if we, if we want to make it clear that it could yeah. be approved by the building commissioner. All right, well, let's, the, put, let's put the language in there that we use saying that the building commissioner can approve it. Okay. Yeah. I don't think we need a public hearing or a public meeting on the, the on this at a later date. I think I'd like to give that discretion to the building commissioner. Um, the applicant's got to work with the fire department on the restrictions, and I think they've already done so on the building plan. Um, this requires inspection services to get out there. The applicant shall have the details for the fuel storage to the fire department. Um, it says you can't transfer the, um, a, the comprehensive permit or assign it, uh, except that which is already in the comprehensive plan. So they, they've laid out how the permit's gonna be given to the, the homeowners association. And then lastly is an affirmative fair marketing plan Selection for income eligible for time home should be finalized prior to the application for a final certificate of occupancy. Lastly, uh, the last two are no slopes created by shall be finished at a grade in excess of the natural angle of proposed materials, of course. And finally, all filled areas would not be built upon within one year shall upon completion of the operation be covered with not less than four inches of loan. Ms. Hild Ms. Greenbaum, do you have a question? Yeah, 67, I think it says inspectional services do you want to just change it to inspection services yes yep good catch were you an editor miss greenbaum oh i write a lot and I, <laughs> well i edited everything my husband wrote yeah well you you have a, a talent for finding them thank you so i would entertain a motion that we approve conditions 64 through 72 with the amendment on condition 65 to add the building commissioners that it's in the building commissioner's determination to decide whether the parking management plan is, is uh, sufficient. And two, that we change inspectional to inspection services. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? If not, the vote occurs on approving 64 through 72 as amended. The chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. White? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Ms. Greenbaum? Aye. All right. The next, are uh, the next several, 73 through 77, are kind of a hodgepodge of things, but they deal with management. So the first is the, it states what is in the project description. Um, this project still consists of homeownership units, create a homeowners association, all the things that they've already pledged to do, but this just confirms that they have to do what they've said they're going to do in terms of um, creating a homeowners association and creating the um, responsibility for common, for common good in the area. Number two, 274 has to do with a, a cause to be drafted a master deed, a sample individual deed, and initial by draft bylaws, which shall be consistent and incorporated in the comprehensive permit decision by reference. Number 75, part of the sale of any unit to provide the draft of the master deed to the town and the bylaws to the board for review by town council. It doesn't mean we have to have a meeting on it. 76, the applicant shall inform all contractors and subcontractors of the wage and tip theft law bylaw. And number 77, there's a question here, does the board want to require the applicant to, to um, deposit a certain sum of money into the HOA account and send for future project needs. So I don't think the first 73 through 76 are controversial um, and are, I think they should be approved easily. The last is a question we haven't dealt with um, and I don't know what the plans of the CDC are for um, sort of um, funding or, or capitalizing the homeowners association. Ms. Allen, is there a plan to do that or does it begin with uh, contributions from each individual homeowner when they get into the, the building? Um, we haven't um, contemplated it at this time. I mean, I think it's a good idea. 
My only concern is that, you know, we're going to have a pretty set development budget. And yeah. so it's really going to depend on, you know, how much of our contingency money do we need to use for unforeseen conditions at the site. And so, you know, I can't guarantee that there's going to be a very specific certain sum of money that might be available at the end of the day. I'm certainly willing to consider having language in there that that discusses like, you know, if it's feasible or something that's a little bit softer rather than absolutely requiring it. I do, like I said, I do think it's a good idea. And I do think that it would be something that we'd be willing to do, but I can't guarantee that the financing of the project or at the end of the day, the development budget would be able to support that. So um, that's just my concern. Got it. Mr. Meadows. Can I suggest that perhaps uh, that if there are monies remaining from whatever contingency funds that the CDC has got allocated for this project, that some percentage of those contingency funds be used to seed this, if not the whole thing. So you, something to the something like to the extent practicable, uh, funds remaining in, funds remaining unused in the contingency fund will be may be. Uh, provided to the homeowners association to capitalize the uh, the association's operation, something to that extent. Something to that extent, yes. Okay. Thank you. Does anybody else have um, a question about that, Miss Murray? Does that can you draft something like that? All right. So let's. Why don't we do this? Let's approve seventy three through seventy six. Miss Murray, you work on the appropriate language that you can read to us for um, seventy seven. And we'll consider that after we do 73 to 76. How's that? Okay. Thank Great. you. Ms. Greenbaum. I, I would suggest maybe not saying something like contingency fund, but say something more general, like in the budget. And then the second thing I wanted to bring up, because it came to me from somebody who lives in a similar project, I believe in Greenfield, where there was no control over the amount of money that was required of tenants every year by the homeowners association. And that money seemed to escalate very rapidly so that it got out of control of what people could afford to pay. Um, I don't know quite how to say this, but can can we put anything like that on the management about um, controlling what the the homeowner fees might be? So, all right. So let's let's divide your question into two things. One, which is I think um, makes sense, Miss Murray, as opposed to saying just contingency plan, saying the contingency fund or other available funds at the. Con at, that a lot of the funds available at the completion of the project would be um, could means that they could draw from more than just a contingency fund if they so chose to capitalize the home ownership, um, home owners association. And then and the from, question would the be can one, we set the, the fee to to um, some to consumer price index or inflation or something like that. The, the well, that's hard to do. I mean, I it's it's really really difficult. The screen bomb. I, you know, I I'm part of a homeowners association, and we have to adjust it on a on a ba on a regular basis. You know, some we get if the roof has to be repaired, we didn't have the we didn't have sufficient um, reserves to do that. We have to assess people, and sometimes that's a one year assessment of a lot of money, and sometimes. We can assess people less because we haven't had a lot of, of need for it. So I would really, you know, that's just part of home ownership is that there are times when you have expenses that you didn't anticipate and it's going to be more expensive than it otherwise would be. Um, and you got to leave, I think we have to leave that up to the homeowners to make that decision as to what, how much they want to increase the home ownership association dues. And and while I would love it if somebody would come to me and say, you know, we can only increase your dues by the cost of living, that doesn't work when you're you got to replace your roof or other kind of common commonly owned goods and facilities in the in our condo. 
So I'm not sure that we can, I'm not, we could do it. I don't know that it's very, I don't know that it makes a lot of sense. No, no, I just brought it up because it was yep. brought to me as an issue. Yeah, I, I can understand. I mean, I, we just got socked and it's, you know, it, it, it uh, takes money away each month that could be used for other things. <clears throat> Mr. Wachilla. I was going to ask of this question to Miss Allen um, or to Attorney Tebow, whoever wants to answer it. But uh, in terms of those fees, I mean, do you have like a general idea of how that's going to be written into the bylaws for the HOA or do you not have that process thought out too much yet? I'll let Attorney Tebow respond to how it's written in the bylaws. Hi. Yeah, I was just pulling them up now. I, I mean, I don't have the specific reference in front of me. But basically, the board is authorized and responsible for, on a yearly basis, determining what is our anticipated budget for the year, what do we think the monthly homeowner fees are going to be. And as part of that, they also are charged with and will work with the property manager to figure out what are our big expenses that we can expect and, and how do we get those paid for. Um, you know, the other thing to consider is that uh, a homeowners association can can take out a loan, too. And so if there is an, an unexpected expense, um, they they will be eligible for financing, just like a, a normal single homeowner could be eligible for financing. Thank you, Ms. Tebow. And, and I guess just to add, um, there are parameters on what kinds of fees they can charge. Um, it has to be reasonable. They can't just say, well, we want we want to take in a lot of extra cushion this year. It has to be based on something. Ms. Tebow, is there also state law that governs what condominium associations and homeowners associations can and can't do in terms of the, I know in some states there are, I don't know if there are in Massachusetts or not. Yeah, we have a, um, Mass General Law Chapter 183A uh, governs um, condominiums. I'd, I'd have to look specifically at the statute um, and the sections therein to determine, um, you know, within our draft master deed and draft bylaws, what is required by statute versus what is just permitted to be in the, de the deed or bylaws. But as, as I understand it, it's those state laws have been drafted in order to avoid uh, either um, lack of sufficient monitoring and, and administration by the homeowners association or the project manager, or to protect individual homeowners from abuse by the, the homeowners association. Correct. So that's, yes. that's the reason those things were that a lot of states have them. Yes, correct. And then so you, the other protection is just the board members are. Right technically elected officials. And so you, as the yeah. homeowners, they vote in who they want to be representing them and taking, helping to manage the condo. Exactly. And there's a, and there's always a requirement for an annual meeting and all those mm -hmm. other kinds of things in a homeowners association. So there's lots of protections there, but you have to leave, I, my feeling is you got to leave it up to the, the homeowners to deal with it. Um, Rob. So um, I know we already approved condition 73 to 76, but can we just maybe consider adding another condition here that references those state laws. The Homeowner Association has to be governed and ran in accordance with those general law chapters. I mean, would, would that be appropriate to include here? Or do you think the board doesn't really care about that too much? I think, well, Ms. Ms. Murray, you tell me, but it seems to me that this is belt and suspenders. They have to do it anyway. I, right. Thank you, Mr. I don't think that's necessary. I mean, the Condo okay. Association has to comply with that statutory scheme. So... I don't mm -hmm. think it's necessary for us to repeat that here. Okay. Thank yeah. you for the clarification. All right. So, um, Ms. Murray, did you come up with um, some language that you could put before us? I do. Um, so for condition 77, it would say, to the extent practicable following construction of the project, any funds remaining in applicants contingency fund or other available funds budgeted for this project. And the question becomes, is it may or shall, we can come back to that, mm -hmm. be deposited into the homeowner's account, a uh, homeowner's association account as seed money for future projects or needs. 
Can you read it to us again? Sure. To the extent practicable following construction of the project, any funds remaining in applicant's contingency fund or other available funds budgeted for this project may or shall be deposited into the Homeowners Association account as seed money for future projects or needs. So first question I have is when we say other available funds, which I know I, I asked you to put in there, I just thought I don't want to take the development fees that Valley has and make them, um, I don't want them to be required to be put into the um, homeowners association. They have, there's a line item that provides for um, some, some kind of uh, cost reimbursement to Valley at the end. And I don't want that to be subject to the homeowners association because that's the reason that they, but it, but it would be available at the end of construction because it's going to go to Valley. So I want to make sure that that's not, it, those fee, those funds aren't um, aren't in danger of being paid into the homeowners association because that's what they wanted, not as a profit, but as the cost of their activities. And I think it should remain there with them. So um, how do we, what we want to say is, so Ms. Allen, you understand what I'm talking about? Yeah, and I, I appreciate you looking out for our best interests. <laughs> but, um, I just want you to, I want you to come back and do more of these. So right. um, and no, I don't I want you to go out of business. Right, and I mean, and I was just sitting here thinking, I don't know. I, I mean, this project's going to be tight budget wise. So, right. you know, if, if I, I just know in like our rental projects, I'm not sure how it would shake out with this home ownership project, but in our rental projects, if there's ever surplus remaining at the end of construction, we often have to give most, if not all of it back to the public funders. Um, and so I'm not sure if that's the case. Um, with this homeowner and with mass housing, this is the first time I'm kind of working with them. Typically we're working with um, executive office of housing and livable communities. So that would be my only reservation is if there's some requirement for us, you know, say construction pricing came in super low and everything went super smooth. It never does, but you know, like best case scenario, um, you know, would we have to have some of that surplus go back to Commonwealth builders I, you know, I don't know. So, okay, so what, if, what if we had some kind of language that says to the extent that their contingency funds unused or other funds not uh, not um, identified for a specific purpose, such as your development costs or that right. the state has said that this has to come back. So we have contingency funds and other funds not already or not otherwise dedicated to another fund to another product or purpose would be maybe available to put into the um, homeowners association. Does that work, Miss Murray? And that was a May. Me, yeah, I, I had a May. Thank you. Okay. And not a shell. We can just discuss that. I put a May out there just because we have to. I think you need to leave some discretion, and um, and I think this is probably going to be. There's not going to be a lot of money left. Um, all right. People's thoughts. Do you want to reread that again to us, Miss Murray, and then we can have people discuss it and we can move uh, to a vote on it. And then I want to get to Mr. Henry's um, amendment that he has on condition. I know he's been drafting up, but I don't want to forget that. Sure. So it would read to the extent practical, practicable following construction of the project, any funds remaining in applicants contingency fund or other funds not otherwise dedicated for specific purpose for this project may be deposited into the homeowners association account as seed money for future projects or needs. I, I like that formulation. Is there any discussion regarding that formulation? If not, I would entertain a motion that we approve that formulation. So moved. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? If not, Vote, if not, the vote occurs on the motion as formulated by Attorney Murray. Chair votes aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Ms. Greenbaum? Aye. Mr. White? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. 
Vote is five to nothing. The motion is approved. Um, lastly, I, that runs through all the conditions that were contained in the decision document. Um, I know, Mr. Henry, you were formulating something for our consideration, and I want to give you a chance to, to um, put that to the board for its discussion and consideration. I emailed to Rob. Rob, I, I sent you an email. <laughs> Let me take a look. All right, so condition eight language. Let me open that up. All right, I'm just gonna get it full screen and I'll reshare my screen with everybody. All right, this is what Mr. Henry sent me. Do you want me to read it, Mr. Chair? I think everybody can, everybody's got a screen before them, don't they? They should. I, I have a edit. Okay, Ms. Greenbaum. Um, number two, and I'm running out of power. That's why I'm in this funny position. Um, the applicant shall provide, record and provide a um, detailed report as to the number of residents who qualify oh, rather than it, because the residents, he qualifies it later on, because that could sort of refer to say by name who they are. And we're really in, only interested in the statistics. Mr. Henry, what's your reaction to that amendment to put the a number of before the word residents on the second paragraph? Yeah, the number of residents. It is, it is meant to be number, so that's fine. Yep, okay. So we got that amendment um, as a friendly amendment. I don't think anybody would object to that. And um, I just want to clarify, um, Attorney Murray, I will send this to you after this meeting tonight so you have it. Thank you. Miss mm -hmm. Murray, you've got your hand up, so. I, you may I do. I, I just wanted to ask, maybe Mr. Henry could clarify. Um, he uses the term, the applicant shall record. I, I want to be clear, we're not talking about the applicant recording something at the Registry of Deeds. Rather, it is just that the the applicant is making a record of or providing a report to the board. The latter, making a record. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And lastly, Mr. Mr. Henry, I noticed you said the applicant shall not be required to disclose the information. And I suspect you'll be that you're there to protect the applicant from but that works to protect the applicant from being required by the town to disclose any information. How about if we just say the applicant shall not disclose any information and we and take away the sh not be required. The applicant shall not disclose any information, name, address, DOB, that could easily identify an individual. I think it, um, I think it changes the meaning if it says not disclose any information. Um, I, I, I think we want some kind of information. We just don't want to encroach on anyone's privacy. Well, yeah, but, but I, what I was going to change, what I was suggesting you change is the sh shall not be required to just say shall not and re delete the required to disclose. The applicant shall not okay. disclose any information. So just take out the okay. required. Is, is that meet with your, because I think it's broader and it gives more protection. It does, so that's that's fine. Okay, you got that, Miss Murray. Great, and Miss Thebal, what do you, uh, you have your hand up? Hi. Oh, I... Thank you. Um, if I was in the room with Jessica right now, I'd be whispering to, to her. But I, since we're not together, I just want to make this heard that I want to make sure that Valley CDC, um, because I know it's it's another group that kind of conducts the lottery that Valley CDC will actually have access to all of this information so that they can in fact provide it. So 
if Jess yes. can confirm Thank that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. So um, Valley doesn't do credit counseling specifically ourselves. Um, the consultant that we've been talking to is a credit counselor. Um, so again, you know, we don't have them under contract yet. We've received their proposals and we're evaluating them. So I don't want to speak on behalf of what the consultants can and cannot provide for information. I mean, I will say that we do do reporting all the time to funders, usually using the HUD standards of reporting for um, for identification. So, you know, we can certainly follow that same model um, for reporting. I'm happy to 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 provide information on who identifies under local preference and sort of look at those numbers. I think that's easy enough to do. I actually have a concern with the term detailed. Um, I think it's kind of a vague term and I'm and I think it actually sort of feeds into what kind of information we'd be providing about individual homeowners. So I'm a little concerned about using that term in sort of detailed report, but we're happy to provide um, you know, a report of a summary of applicant um, information and demographic information as we are legally allowed to to qualify or to allowed to ask. There are certain questions we're certainly we're not allowed to ask. So I would want to make sure that we're meeting those fair housing standards and, um, you know, and that we're not setting Valley up for something that we don't actually have the capacity to do ourselves like the credit counseling. That's a very legal term. And I'm not sure, um, you know, it's not something we do. That's why we're hiring somebody else to do it. But they would they be able to get you information? You'd, be, you'd get the information from the credit counseling, right? Potentially, but I don't know what information they are legally able to provide. Um, I can certainly say, you know, number of people that have been counseled, number of applicants that have been counseled and uh, are in, you know, received a home or were able to purchase a home. But, you know, beyond that, I don't think it's fair to disclose somebody's information about, you know, their credit score gained 57 oh, no. points, you know, not, you know, but I think we could give you the number of applicants that have been taking it that will take advantage of these, uh, these services that we are offering as part of this. But in terms of the details of, um, you know, outside sort of those HUD reporting standards, I don't, I'm not sure we're able to do that. So I'd, I would want to make sure that the reporting is consistent with how we report for other funders for other programs. Mr. Henry, do you have, do you, do you have a sample of a HUD reporting format or standard? I'd have to dig. It's not my department. It's something that they've been actually working and modifying um, to sort of to meet our DEI um, requirements that we are um, self-imposed, <laughs> trying to, to be better at. Um, so, you know, it's typically like race, ethnicity, number of people in the household, general income, maybe um, ranges. It's not going to be a specific number, but are you within this range? You know, general demographic information. So I guess, Mr. Henry, what's your opinion of the word, removal of the word detailed? So again, just going back to um, my initial qualifier, is not make is this is not meant to make anything overly burdensome, and as a caveat, to the extent allowed by law. Um, so if I, I appreciate that there would be restrictions, that and that's reasonable. Um, but to the extent that you can provide the information, um, I, I think it should be provided. Okay. So would you add to the extent allowed by extent provided by law or allowed by law someplace in that second, se second sentence? Is that what you're saying? It's at the, it's at the top. Um, oh, I see. I see. You say it up there at the very beginning. Got you. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. So all this is, none of this can be done outside of what's allowed by law, is what you're saying. Yeah. Correct. Well, I think it seems to me that if we adopt this as, um, as written, and there was one, it's getting late, I'm trying to remember, did we already have one kind of accepted friendly amendment to this? Other than, not detailed, but didn't we have one friendly amendment? Yeah. To, 
residents. I had it put it, I had added number. Um, right, right, number of residents, yeah. So what, with include, including that amendment, um, if we adopt this and there are details that need to be um, tweaked because we don't have all the information of what HUD has or something else, can we leave it up to the, is, would, would it not be in the building commissioners or somebody in the town's ability to decide whether they, whether this, the action, the information that was received comports with the intent of the, of this condition? Is there some ability for a town person, a town official to say, yes, um, you've done, you've met the requirements of this condition or no, that it has not been met. Um, so I'm trying to give, I'm trying to get this approved or, or something like this approved and not have to wait for somebody to, to check with HUD or some other place to see the kind of precise information that can be gathered. So I would like to say something. All right, just a second. And unless it's right to that point, Ms. Greenbaum, I'd, I'd like to resolve that one and then we'll go to your point. Okay. Um, Ms. Brestrup, can you speak to what I'm inartfully trying to accomplish? Well, I think what you're trying to accomplish is to know where this information is going. So right now this says to the town of Amherst, and maybe it should be directed to the Zoning Board of Appeals or to the Housing Trust or to the town manager or to some entity rather than to the town of Amherst. That individual or entity that can then do something with the information. But if it just goes to the town of Amherst, it goes into the ether and, you know, doesn't nothing right. happens to it. So do you want it to go to the board, to the Zoning Board of Appeals? Is that what we want here? And then the Zoning Board can evaluate it and use that information in upcoming um, cases of this type? Or is there someone else who would be more suitable to have it? Um, off the top of my head, I can't think of who else would that would be. So it seems like presenting this information to the Zoning Board of Appeals is potentially useful for the ZBA. I think Does that, that your question, Mr. Oh, Judge? I, yeah, that helps. What do you think, Mr. Henry? No, I, I would agree with Ms. Bestrup. I think given that what we're trying to achieve is to, aim to see future projects, how this played out, I think the ZBA would be the appropriate body for it to go to. Okay. So is a, a suggestion that we substitute the board of uh, we substitute the board for the town of Amherst in the first three in the three sentences. Yes. Okay. What board? ZBA. ZBA. Okay. And then I think it's even more important than that the applicant uh, shall not disclose any information. And the, the only the only thing I have is that we're a, we're a board as opposed to a an individual, and and um, we can share this. I want to make sure that the information that we get as a board is, uh, um, I don't know how to pronounce this word, but an and I <laughs> not identifiable. It's anonymized. There's there's a there's a word that it, I see in privacy um, reporting and legislation that says that it's that it's anonymized. <laughs> there's, anyway, I want to, that's what I want to make sure um, is that there's no identifiable information, and I think that that's clear by in the last sentence by saying it, the applicant shall not disclose anything that can identify an individual. So I'm, com I'm comfortable with the ZBA as the re recipient of this information. And you are too, Mr. Henry, so that's good. How about Ms. Greenbaum? What do you have to say? I, I want more information than just who qualified on the local preference. I want to know um, as to residents who applied and and to add to the end of that, um, among the 30 units, how many were local residents under the definition of live, work, or send the kids to school? So I, I want it more broad. I want to know about all 30 units, not just the seven. So as to the number of residents who applied and then qualified under local preference and, and um, other bias of the project. How many for the other uh, twenty-three units? How many? 
Volca residents in the other 23 units. Let's see. I want to know that we're, we're spending our tax money for people who, who um, also pay taxes to this town in one way or another by living or working here and, and have a chance to live in this project. All of these homeowners will be paying taxes in the town of Amherst once they- No, no, but I mean that I'm now supporting this project. Applicant showed a court provided the top detail report. I mean, I'm not, that, that's my reason for wanting it, that, that we are supplying housing for people who live and work here. And, 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 and I'd like those statistics. I'd love it for every project. And I had another question. Which well, I didn't let's deal, let's, go ahead, go ahead. My other question was um, in terms of the housing inventory, when you build rental housing, at least some of the projects, Rolling Green, for example, all of the units count in the inventory of, of uh, even though they're not all affordable, you have a mix of market rate and affordable and they're all cost. So why do the 100% units here not count? That's if my may, question. If, I'm, if I may answer that one, Mr. Chair. Yes, Ms. Mary. Um, the difference probably has to do with rental units versus home ownership. When you have a project that in, that is a rental project, and as long as you've got 25% of those units that are dedicated and restricted as affordable units, the town gets credit for every single one of those rental units. When you have a home ownership project, you only get credit on the SHI for the actual home ownership units that are deed restricted at the 80 percent ami that's the law that's why that is yes okay well can can we fix up that second sentence so that we know know more about local residents as defined uh applied and qualified and and how many local people are living in the 30 units well we're going to know how many people were in the pool and we're going to know how many people qualified under local preference out of that pool. So we know okay. who's in the pool, where they will. Well, we'll know the number. We'll, I mean, the, the applicant, the, the pool will be created. We'll know how many people were in that pool. And I think what we're trying to get at is, what you're trying to get at is, of those people that are in the pool, and then of those people that were given that won a slot, how many of them qualified under local preference? And I think you just have to do the math from that, that, well, there was seven people that qualified for, you know, seven people that qualified under local preference, and that's not going to be the case, but well, seven people that qualified under local preference, um, 30 were in the pool, um, another three qualified without local preference, so therefore, um, seven qualified under local preference, three were not under local preference, and 20 people weren't, didn't get the, the slot. So I don't know if you need to, I don't know, Ms. Greenbaum, if you need to how many people play that out. It's all, it's all there, I think. I want to know how many people in the 30 units came from Amherst or worked here or sent kids to school here. That's if, what I want to know. If I can respond, I, the people who are going to end up being in this in this development are going to be adequately sized households and meet the qualifications of a disproportionately impacted household, which means living in a qualified census tract. Right. So if they live outside the qualified census tract of Amherst, they're most, even if they put in for it, they're probably not going to get a home because they don't meet the first two requirements. So we're happy to provide the information, but I just want you to, again, remember that living in the yeah. qualified census tract is of a higher weight than local preference. And so they could be coming from a different qualified census tract. And then they, have a, and they will have a- I wanna know. I wanna know when we get done with the 30 units, where these people are coming from. And hopefully- But we only, but well, we only control on, on that, we only control for the 10 units that are 80%. We don't have any, we're not allowed to acquire local preference for the other ones by state no, law. I know, 
Yeah. And, and she can, and they will have that information and they will have that information already. They can provide the information to the ZBA or to, right? You'll have that information, Ms. Allen, I mean, right? they have to be, they have to qualify for this proportionally impacted household in order to be ranked, to be put in the right tier for the lottery process. So we will know if people live in qualified census tracts. We could probably tell you which qualified census tract people are right. living in. That would be good. That would help. That would be but, very helpful. But the blanket statement of who in Amherst, again, we could tell you there are people outside the qualified census tract that are submitting applications. But again, I think the numbers are going to show that we're going to have way more applicants than homes available because these price points are so low compared on the market. And we're going to have people applying outside the qualified census tract that are not going to be weighted as high as those that do live in a qual in the qualified census tract. So, Miss Allen, you can give us which census tract they came from in the future, right? You can give us that information. I can tell you who's going to be coming from a qualified census tract. I'm not going to be able to. I, it would be burdensome for us to pull the address for everybody and tell you if they what qual what census tract they live in. But I can certainly tell you if somebody lives in a qualified census tract because that's going to be one of our ranking criteria. So that's okay. information I can certainly provide. All right, Mr. Meadows. Would it not be more appropriate for this information to go to the Amherst Housing Authority? It just seems illogical to me that that the ZBA take this on when it's not part of our uh, charter to do so. And it, it, this information can be used by the housing authority. It's not going to be much use to us. Um, the only reason it'd be useful to us is if we have another program like this in the future and we want to evaluate how the, how the Which program we could get works. the information. Then we could ask uh -huh. the housing authority to give us the information. Right. Which then they could probably give us a lot more information right now than we can get out of this. Ms. Brestwick, you have your hand up. Yeah, I don't think the Housing Authority is the right um, organization to deal with. It's possible that the Housing Trust would find this information useful and might be able to do something in the future, but the Housing Authority is really a group that owns property in town and rents it to people who are qualified. So it's not really involved in this kind of process. They don't get involved at all in comprehensive permits or local preference or any of the things that we're talking about. It's a it's a group that's outside of the town jurisdiction. It's um, it's a quasi state organization. So if you wanted to have another group that was specifically interested in housing, you might say that the information could be provided to the housing trust, which is a local group that deals with housing needs in Amherst. That, well, what about the planning department? And the planning department. Yep. I mean, yeah. Just take us out and put it to the planning department. There are people that deal with. You deal with these kinds of issues all the time. We do. Um, so you could yes. say the planning department, hey, what about that? board of appeals, I mean, and the housing the planning department. I think that makes more sense than the ZBA. Okay. You know, I, I also I, I expressed some concern about having this information to a board that turns over, and you know, we're right. not as we're, we're not as responsible for. We're into, we're volunteers. We're not responsible for how you handle confidential information, and I'm somewhat concerned about that. So. The planning department makes sense. Mr. Henry, what do you think about that? It's your amendment. I, I, I'm perfectly fine if it goes to um, a department that will see value in the information. Um, yeah. but, to your, but to your earlier point, if we're doing this project again, or if it comes back before the ZBA, as long as we, the information can be easily accessible to the ZBA, I'm, I'm comfortable with wherever it goes initially. Okay. Which well, we will be I, sure I to. A, I sense a consensus here on yeah. changing town of Amherst, or changing ZBA to the, the planning department. Also, Mr. Should... Chair, um, I just want to say that any information we do get that's relevant, we always share with the boards, no matter what. So that's just a standard practice we do in the planning department, anyways. Good. That's helpful to know. So, consensus on moving to the planning department, consensus on removing the word detailed, consensus on shall uh, shall not disclose then the last sentence the applicant shall not disclose um anything else miss miss uh, greenbaum i think the information that you wish to gather doesn't have to be detailed here in fact i'm not even sure how to write it but we will get it from the 
um, applicant and the planning department will be able to uh, interface with them and make sure we get yeah, the information. My feeling is that it would be very useful to have when people keep screaming the, about affordable housing, affordable housing, that what we're building is going to people who live here. And where I, I expect it's going to be used. And I'm down to 1%, so if I disappear, I'll call you on the phone. Okay. All right. I'm so we're in. we're going to try to move as quickly. We're going to try to move through this as quickly as possible so that maybe your 1% will last to the end of the meeting. So what I'd like to do is vote on this um, condition. This would be condition 78 um, as amended through the consensus amendments that I have stated, and I think you've got those all. Uh, do, do you not, Miss Murray? Yep, so she's got the consensus amendments. I don't think I have a need to go through those again. I just stated them. Mr. So Chair, I, um, yes. this is actually a addition to condition eight, this this language right here. Exactly right. Thank you, Rob. Yes. Thank you. No, no problem. In addition to condition eight. Thank you. Thank you. So I would entertain a motion that we amend condition eight to include the uh, Henry Amendment with the consensus amendments to that amendment that have been described by me. So moved. Second? Second. Moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? If not, the vote occurs on the amendment as amended to condition eight. The chair votes aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Ms. Greenbaum? Aye. Meadows, Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. White. Aye. All right. We have dealt with all the conditions that were before us um, in the, the decision document and well as an additional um, amendment. Is there any other conditions that board members wish to offer? All right. We're at nine o'clock. I would like to finish this tonight. And that would mean that we'd have to stay for another half hour or so to go through findings. Um, unless, unless that is, uh, and, and Ms. Greenba Greenbaum, you're going to have to get on your phone, I think, but I would like to, to, to finish this tonight so we don't have to go back and, and do anything more. Ms. Brestrup, you have your hand up. Yeah, we spoke with uh, Ms. Murray about the findings, and she incorporated the findings into this decision. Um, so I don't think you necessarily need to go through the findings in the project application report. You may want to get a confirmation of that from Ms. Murray, but I oh. think we, we specifically, the staff specifically asked Ms. Murray to look at those findings and to incorporate them into the decision. Well, that's some of the best things I've heard tonight. <laughs> <laughs> You're, you are welcome to bring us that kind of news anytime you want, Ms. Brestrup. And Ms. Murray, if you confirm that, you'll have a place in all of our hearts. <laughs> it and for for your reference and for the boards, it's um, under Roman numeral four, statement of relevant material facts and findings. It's broken down there. All right. Well, I went through all the conditions. I was not troubled. I mean, all the findings. I was not troubled by any finding, and I think we made all those findings with the conditions that we have adopted and the waivers we have granted. So, I think we're coming to the point where we have a vote on approving the comprehensive permit as conditioned. Oh, Mr. White. Just real quick, and yep. this is a complete non-issue, but since we're going to vote on it, um, <clears throat> Mr. Wachilla, uh, my name is misspelled on the decision. Not a big deal. <laughs> it's actually uh, Attorney Murray who's got to fix that one. Um, was, is okay. it 1L, <laughs> Philip, instead of the two? Yeah, it's always one okay. Okay. My apologies. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> All right. So, Ms. Brestrup, I think the last, we only have one motion to make before, as, as we um, approve, we vote to approve the comprehensive permit as, uh, as, with conditions. This vote requires three, not five, not four, three votes to approve this motion. And so I would entertain a motion that the board, Mr. Wachilla. I would also include Mr. Chair to close the public hearing as well. In that, oh, is that motion? Yep, I will do that. I would entertain a motion that we approve the comprehensive permit 
Now let me get that number, just for the record. ZBA FY 2024-03 Valley Community Development Corporation that we approve the comprehensive permit with conditions that the staff be authorized to make technical and conforming changes to make sure that Mr. White's name is spelled correctly along with other technical changes and conforming changes and that we close the public hearing on this matter. So moved. So moved. And is there a second? Second. Second. So we have a um, motion and um, a second. Is there any discussion? If there's no discussion. The vote occurs on the motion. The chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows. Aye. Mr. Henry. Aye. Mr. White. Aye. Ms. Greenbaum. Aye. The vote is five to nothing. The motion passes. Congratulations, Valley CDC, Ms. Thank Allen, you. Ms. Debo. It's been a long process. Oh my um, goodness. It's been a long process. I think this was the eighth, the, I think this was the seventh or the eighth hearing we've had on this. Um, and I think that's, that's a good use of the town's time because this is a really important project. And I hope that it's really, I hope that it's successful. And I'm Thank sure you. that it will be. And we, Thank we, we do appreciate the work that you guys do uh, and the success that you've had. And we appreciate the, uh, and I also appreciate all the time that's been put in by the staff and by other members on this. I think yes. Thank you. I appreciate you accommodating by adding extra meetings to your schedule. I know that's not always ideal for board members because you are all volunteers. So I want to really give a heartfelt thank you to um, you know, accommodating your schedule and, and sort of making sure that we keep this process moving. So. All right. We'll go out and get those units built. We can use them here. We will. All right. <laughs> now, now that we've got the permit, now we're all, all ready to go. So. Now the work really begins. All now right. the work really begins. Yep. <laughs> Ms. Brestra, uh, what have I forgotten? I just wanted to say thank you, a hearty thank you to Carolyn Murray for sticking with oh, us and for you. keeping <laughs> us out of trouble. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very yes. much. <laughs> yes. Anytime. For, My pleasure. <laughs> I I agree with that. I think we all do. Thank uh, you. Mr. Mr. Chair, if I may ask, um, I guess Ms. Brestrup, I'll ask this too. I mean, should we go over next steps after this meeting tonight with what's going to happen with the applicant? Um, or do you think that's not necessary? Because we usually do that for all of our special permits. You, you know, I think it's up to you guys. I don't think we need to go through that recitation okay. of what they have to do and who they have to follow. I think there's going to be a lot of discussion between you um, and their lawyers and, and our lawyer and everything that's going to be, you're going to be intensely working with each other. So it's not like yeah. these are homeowners who haven't done this before. I also remember that this was supposed to be five or six meetings and it somehow turned into eight, almost nine throughout the course of this. So I'm glad we finally wrapped it up. I think I that's, I think that's an indication of how important you think it is. May I make one more request that Ms. Yes. Murray add the ZBA number to this, ZBA FY 2024-03, just to make it easier for us to file this in our filing system. Yeah. So, right. Thank you very I much. I agree with that one. All right. Well, congratulations. Um, thank you. Ms. Allen and Ms. Tebow, you're allowed to stay on. We're going to go to uh, the other items on the agenda, but if you just can't pull yourself away from spending time with us. You're welcome, to, you're welcome to stay on. Um, the next order of business is public comment on any matter not before the board tonight. So if anybody in the public wishes to speak to anything except the matter before the board tonight, now's the time to do so. Please so indicate by raising your hand or by hitting star nine on your phone. All right, I see no other, um, no hands up. The next order of business is any new business where we typically talk about the schedule for the oncoming, uh, uh, the upcoming meetings. And Rob, what do we have coming up? Sure, I'll be quick. Um, so next meeting, March 28th, normally scheduled ZBA meeting. Uh, we have three permit hearings, three of which are special permits. Uh, the first is for a flag lot. The second is for an addition to an existing accessory dwelling unit. And the third is for the Hickory Ridge um, trail system in which um, the ZB has to approve 
the construction of structures in the flood prone conservancy FPC zoning district. Um, and then on the 25th of April, which is two, three meetings from now, we have the continued hearing for the Shutesbury solar um, special permit. And um, we have the continued hearing for the flag lot on Shays Street. Um, other than that, Mr. Chair, that is all that we have on the radar for the future. Um, no more 40B for a little while. For so a while. Uh, we'll be for going back meeting. to. Sorry. So we have a meeting on the 28th of March. Yes. Yep. And then the next meeting is the 25th of April. Uh, so actually, the next meeting after that is April 11th. Uh, it just so happens we don't have anything scheduled until April 25th after that March 26th meeting. So it's very possible we might get something submitted within the next couple of weeks that might take that April 11th spot. Obviously, I'll let the board know during the March 28th meeting. Okay. But that's all I have. Okay. Um, that's it for the meeting tonight. I would just want to say one more time to the to the staff, to Rob and to Christine, thank you very much for your hard work on this. This has been a long process. It's important. You guys um, kept us on the straight and narrow when we needed it and, we, and gave us a lot of support for, what, um, for an important project. So thank you very much once again. Amherst staff and planning staff has really pulled it together and done a great job. So thank you. And to the, my board, fellow board members, thank you very much for all your extra time you put in. Thank you for the work you've done on this. Um, I think it's important. And I also want to thank all of you for the way in which we've dealt with, which at times were contentious issues. I think we've dealt with it in sensitivity. I think people have tried their best. They did really a good, good job of, of expressing their opinions and what could have been um, a difficult discussion was a very helpful and, and open discussion. And I want to appreciate, I appreciate from all, that from all of you. So thank you I, and uh, thank you for all the work. So with that, I want to make sure that we um, we adjourn. So without any, if there's any further discussion, this is the time for it. Otherwise, a motion to adjourn is pending, and it will be without. Uh, it's non-discussable, non-debatable. So, so moved. Is there a second? <laughs> Aye. All right, Mr. Henry is seconded. Mr. Meadows has moved that we adjourn. The motion is not debatable. The chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows. Aye. Mr. Henry. Aye. Mr. White. Aye. And Ms. Greenbaum. Aye. Five to nothing, the vote carries. We are adjourned. Thank you all guys and we'll see